Hello, everyone, and welcome to our June 2022 FreeBSD Developer Summit, um, the first day today. Uh, I want to do a couple of things before we get started. Um, first of all, uh, we are trying something a little bit different uh, with this Developer Summit in terms of our scheduling and, and the hallway track. We're trying to um, hopefully provide a better venue for a lot more ad hoc discussions. So the hallway track is a bit different this time. It's on a different platform. Uh, that uh, we've learned about from some other BSD conferences, particularly from EuroBSDCon. It's on a platform called Spatial Chat. Uh, and there's a link in your registration email that you got uh, to join that if you'd like. And it will be up the entire time during the conference and you're free to meet over there to talk. We're also going to have more breaks uh, or longer breaks during the conference this year to give more time to hang out, <clears throat> sorry, in the hallway track between sessions and just kind of meet with folks and network and have more discussions that way. Um, a couple other things. And so um, in, a, in a second here, I'm going to hand it over to Anne, who is going to give more details and maybe a little demo of using the hallway track. Um, one of the things in the hallway track is we do have, uh, if you go, if you log into the spatial chat, there's two rooms currently set up. One is kind of a lobby where you can meet and hang out with folks using Spatial's platform. There's a second room, which is a kind of live stream of the Dev Summit itself. So if you're on that platform and you want to check out what's going on the live stream, you can. You can kind of pop over to that room and watch the YouTube feed and then pop back over to the lobby. Um, aside from that, I did want to offer a couple of uh, specific shout outs and thanks. Um, uh, I know I get to speak at the start of these um, the last few times, but it's always a team that puts this together with recruiting speakers and arranging the technology we use and so forth. Um, so I wanted to thank um, Anne Dickinson, Deb Goodkin, Lauren, uh, it's not here yet, she's still getting up, I think, um, um, and Ed Mast for helping to organize and the summit this year. I also wanted to thank the FreeBC Foundation um, for sponsoring the summit and kind of handling it, the costs that we have. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Anne so she can talk more about the hallway track. Sorry. Everything far away. OK, so let me share my screen. Hi, everyone. Uh, I will share with you. John said many of you have used it before, so it probably won't be. Uh, well, we're going to do this today. Uh, hold on a sec. It's going away. Oh, we are. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, why is it every time we do this, <coughs> it doesn't show up for me? There we go. Let's see. <coughs> All right. We're ready now. Pardon the technical difficulties. Can everyone see that? I'm going to try thing, or at least folks who are can talk. Can you see that? <laughs> um, all right. Yeah. So this is sort of what the, as he said, lobby, <laughs> John said lobby looks like. Uh, and so this is sort of where you can all start your conversations. If you click on yourself, you will see a bubble. And in that bubble, that is about the radius of which people can hear what you're saying. The further away you go, bubble, the less you'll be able to hear the conversation closer. So if you wanna have a conversation with someone that isn't with all the people around, you can just move to a different table and have that conversation there. Um, so if there's someone you wanna to talk to specifically, then you can click on them and it will take you to them um, so that you can have a conversation that way. There are options for emojis. Up in the corner here is a chat functionality in which you can speak through the whole room or you can speak directly to a person who's in the hallway track. If as, uh, and then you close the chat, if you wanna see this little guy up here, person up here says um, to show you the rooms. And as John mentioned, we also have the uh, lives happening over here. Um, now you will probably lose your, oh, I should mute that. Um, that's not at all distracting. You can, you probably lose your picture and or your video and your microphone when you go from room to room. There's also a chat here as well. Um, so you can talk to people in this room. So let me go back. Okay, so that's pretty much the functionality. Um, so I think 
um, any questions, you can always message in all the different channels that are available, Slack, live stream, et cetera. Uh, but it's pretty straightforward. You can zoom in and zoom out to be closer or, um, you know, see the whole room, see where folks are. Everybody comes into the room in this one spot. So that's where everyone will start. Um, you also have the option to, you know, camera off, like pretty typical um, sort of chat functionality or streaming functionality things. So I think that's it. So unless I've forgotten something, John, um, that's my part for the day. Uh, did you have anything else you wanted to talk? Nope. I think that was a pretty good demo. I think it covered um, things. Um, and we'll definitely all uh, the folks on here will be active over in the hallway track in between talks, maybe some of us during talks. Um, uh, but we you know, certainly we want folks to have this to be a productive time where uh, you can listen to the talks and interact with those, but you can also interact with each other um, and just be community. So our first talk today is uh, an update on the FreeBSD Foundation, which is going to be from Deb Goodkin and Ed Mast. And I think Deb is going to go first. So I'm going to hand it over to Deb. Okay, thanks, John and Anne. Um, let's see, go ahead. There's a few of us that are going to talk from the foundation. And hopefully everyone can hear me if you can't, if you could put something in the chat box and so I will know. But hi everyone, I'm Deb Goodkin. I'm the executive director of the FreeBSD Foundation. And um, thank you for attending. I don't know how many people uh, we ended up having register for this conference, I think, or it's a summit, um, maybe 130. We have some feedback here, so I'm not exactly sure why that's happening. <laughs> so I'm going to my. I don't know if Anne or John, if you can help, if you're hearing also the feedback. Um, I don't hear any feedback. I just I, hear you. But oh, maybe. you don't. So I hear it. I fixed it. I think it might have been me. You still okay. hear? Okay. <laughs> I, I still you hear. Turn it. off your spatial chat. Is it better now? I think it's Let's your spatial chat. I think you have to turn that off. Well, okay, in spatial chat, I have my mic off. Oh, okay, the I'm not, track. or the hallway. <laughs> Did I say spatial chat? I like that name. Um, okay, so great. So, um, so I want to thank everyone for joining. I think uh, we have maybe 130 or more uh, folks who are actually registered, and so that means that they're either watching um, here on Zoom or. Uh, through the live stream, which is great. And watching the registrations come in is great because it's there's so many names of folks that I know from over the years, as well as other people who I've never heard um, of. So it's we have new and uh, old, maybe not old in age, but who are joining us today. And so anyway, I want to thank you for attending. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. And let's find the right window. We'll get started. Um, as I, I know everyone's really excited about the talks and some of the discussions that are going to be happening today. So I'm going to try to make this fairly quick. But my whole purpose is to uh, talk about the foundation, what we do, and why we exist. And, um, and then hand it over to Ed Max, who will talk about more of the software planning that um, and work that we're doing. So. I could do this. I know John already covered this, but I do want to thank the organizing committee. They've been working or meeting weekly since the last summit, which was last November, and that was also virtual. We're hoping that the next summit, the vendor summit that is always planned in the fall, that will that will be in person. So really, you know, praying and fingers crossed that that will happen in person. So our purpose really is to serve you, the community, and the project. And so who what is the community? That's that's you folks who are here today, as well as you know thousands of other people around the world, and from anyone who does you know all these things that I've listed here and more, and you know from contributing uh, software to fixing bugs to writing tests to running tests to advocating for FreeBSD. There's so many different ways to contribute that you all are doing, and thank you. For doing that and really we wouldn't be here without you so that's if you weren't here there's no purpose for us to be here and we are for the here for the public good so what it means is that uh, we're not a trade association like some other most of the other foundations 
I'm getting feedback again. So if someone just switched something, but um, anyway, so we are, our purpose here is to step in and fill critical needs of the project. So there's not always a volunteer who can step in to do work. And so that's where we try to step in if we can, if we have the resources to do that, to really make FreeBSD the best solution for so many different applications. A little bit about our history. We have been around since 2000, so we've been around for a long time, 22 years. Uh, we're classified as a 501c3, and uh, which really means that's a U.S. or United States uh, classification for tax purposes. And it really means that we're, we're truly a nonprofit. We're here for the public good. We're based in Colorado, in Boulder. That's where I'm located, and we're headquartered here. But most of the team of folks from staff to board members are located all over the world. And we are uh, funded 100% by donations. And I'll talk about that a little bit. I'm in a, um, while we're doing this, I don't know if it switches the window when I do this, but I'm gonna close my spatial chat just in case that's causing issues. Okay, so hopefully we're back. Uh, to the slide on the board, and if we're not, if someone could message me to let me know. So um, this is our board of directors. They are responsible for governing the foundation. They are not hands-on in the project. They may be um, as individuals, but not as board members. And you'll, you may see a uh, recognized new face here. We just had our annual board meeting a couple of weeks ago, and we had elections. We have elections every year. And Kat Allman joined us. We're very fortunate to have her. She is well known and respected within the open source and technology world. And she works at Google. And um, we had two people who actually um, dropped off uh, our board, who stepped down, uh, Bendit Ruchling and Kirk McCusick, who we really appreciated all their contributions over the last uh, many years. And um, and it's really good for us to see turnover, to get new people, to get new, new blood, new, you know, more excitement and passion for FreeBSD, and also just bring a different uh, knowledge and experience to help uh, guide our direction. And they help us plan um, really our strategic direction. So we look, they help us uh, look at the bigger picture of what we're here for and why, why we're doing what we're doing. Uh, Benedict um, was actually elected to the core team, so you um, so you actually benefit from him moving over to that position. And then this is our team, and I'm sharing our org chart just so you can see who uh, works for the foundation, because most likely you'll be um, you know dealing with some of these folks if you're interacting with the foundation. And so I'll start with we do have a marketing department, and marketing is really I would say ninety percent of the time is advocating for free BSD. So uh, they provide a lot of content and do a lot of promotional work for the project. Next, Ed Mass group, and he will talk more about what they're doing within this, um, this group. But we have a bunch of software uh, engineers on our staff who review um, you know, submission or commits and uh, changes and uh, implement code and support platforms and do all sorts of work. And, uh, and we do have an open position. It's not officially uh, public yet. We don't have the job description fully um, completed yet, but we will be having uh, one to three um, open positions for software developers, uh, most likely this year. Moving on, Brad Davis, he's a long time FreeBSD um, contributor. He, um, he helps us out with our IT. And Laura Gorkowski, you may be familiar with her if you reach out to the foundation on uh, regarding donations. She does all of our donation management and um, also any application that comes in for a travel grant or a grant or inquiries into the foundation. And then finally, we are looking for a fundraiser per fundraising person, but that's also not on our website yet, but we'll get there. So we support five main areas, and uh, I'm not going to go into detail on this, but just to highly um, you know, summarize, Ed will cover all the software development work that we're doing and, and some of our plans. Like I said before, we do a lot of advocacy and education, and we're planning on growing the education component. We have staff members who are on the security team, 
Uh, we support infrastructure in the cluster by buying and supporting uh, the hardware that goes in there. And then uh, we have Lee Wen who does our uh, continuous integration and um, a lot of automation uh, work that's going on there. We were, we were started to take over the FreeBSD trademark. And so uh, we do support the project with any type of legal issue that comes up. Usually that will come from the core team and it might be a question about patents or export law or things like that. And so we'll step in and help. And then finally, just like today, we support um, these summits and conferences and FreeBSD type of events. And uh, they were in person before the pandemic. And since then, obviously they've all gone virtual. And we're really hoping, I mean, the first one, the first in-person one that will happen will be the Developer Summit, which will be associated with EuroBSDCon. So it's pretty exciting that we may meet in person again. I won't really go through this list, but it just highlights a lot of the advocacy work that we do. I, I was going to try to give a tour of our website, but I'm really not going to have time for that, which is fine. We have a lot of resources on our website, how-to guides, videos. We also list a lot of other uh, resources out there, folks doing videos and writing articles and things like that. Uh, but a couple of things I want to highlight is we do uh, fund the FreeBSD Journal, which is a free publicate professionally published publication um, and uh, and very well written articles and by uh, mostly FreeBSD folks. And so if you're not getting this, you, you really should subscribe. And, um, and then also if you just wanna learn about more introductory topics within FreeBSD, we have this whole FreeBSD Friday series and you can get all of those on our, you can find them on our website and then also on the FreeBSD Foundation YouTube uh, channel. So some of the upcoming events I wanna talk about real quickly, uh, it's uh, FreeBSD's uh, birthday or anniversary on June 19th and it will be 29 years old, pretty amazing. I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit more. Uh, the next conference will be at a scale, which is in Los Angeles. And so if you're in the Southern California area and you want to attend, uh, you can use this code and you'll get 50% off your registration. We'll be there giving a workshop on FreeBSD as well as staffing a table. And uh, I think this is our fourth year doing the workshop and every year we've done it, it's, we've had a full room. So there's a lot of interest in learning about FreeBSD and we're not the only workshop happening. So um, you know, if we were, we would probably have even more attendees. So anyway, that's exciting. Uh, and then EuroBSDCon will be happening in Vienna in September and it will be preceded by the Developer Summit, which is for two days and they're looking for um, submissions for talks there. So if you have something you want to talk about, you're planning on attending, then submit one. And then one more event that I did not add because I right before the started, I, uh, I got a notification that our workshop was accepted for Women Courage, which is the European Women in Computing Conference. And <clears throat> so all the plan is right now, Steriana and I will give a workshop there. It's right after Euro BSDCon. And if we could find uh, maybe one more person who would like to give the workshop with us, that would be great. But it's basically a two hour workshop on getting uh, started with FreeBSD. And then a little bit more about FreeBSD Day. It's, we're gonna celebrate over uh, the whole week. And it basically, it's, it's a time to share your love and passion for FreeBSD. So we ask everyone who loves FreeBSD to, to promote FreeBSD, share content, share videos, Talk about why you love FreeBSD. Um, we will have this. You can go to this URL at the bottom, and uh, you'll be able to uh, find out more um, information about what our plans are, as well as links to uh, various uh, videos and stuff that you can share. I'm just showing this case study because uh, this is something that we've started doing: is writing case studies of. Uh, companies who are successfully using FreeBSD, and we would love to have more stories that we could share. So if you're working at a company that is using FreeBSD and you um, would like to share your story, we would love to work with you. And we do most of the work. We just do an initial interview, and then we have a technical writer who will write it up. So, so let us know.
So how can we help you? Uh, we can fund a project if you have one that you think will help benefit for EBSD. Uh, we help with travel expenses. We have a whole travel grant program that you apply for. Um, if you, and, and that's for attending a FreeBSD related event, or if you want to give a FreeBSD workshop somewhere too, we will help, or we can help with that too. Uh, we do purchase hardware and software for uh, special needs. Uh, like if you're working on a specific platform and you want to see that in the cluster, uh, we can purchase that to help you out too. Uh, we love promoting the work that you're doing. So if we're not already promoting it, reach out to us and um, we may even decide to write a blog post about it. And then we also uh, provide stipends or stipends and for different uh, programs out there like the Google Summer of Code. So now we're doing a risk five um, mentorship. We work with universities to do internships and we are working on expanding it. Uh, it really the um, bottleneck there would be just finding more mentors to help with that. And you can reach out to us at info at freebsdfoundation.org if you have any questions. Also, I will be, well, all of us will be in the, uh, the hallway track, so you can always ask questions. And then finally, as far as fundraising go, I mean, this is the hardest part of our work is, I mean, we need money to do the work. It's, we're 100% funded by donations. And, um, and so we have to ask uh, companies and we have to ask individuals to help sponsor and fund. Um, our work. And so the graph is showing what we've raised and spent over the years since we started. Um, and just to highlight where we're at now, uh, we, our budget is 2 million. Our goal to raise is at a minimum of 1.4. Um, and we're, we've only raised 135,000. And the biggest reason is because it, it, it takes a lot of time to ask and I really have to um, get out there and start asking. But what I'd like to do is ask you to help us um, make an individual contribution to help support our work. And also if you're working in a company that's benefiting from FreeBSD and or open source in general, I mean, the work that we do helps the open source ecosystem greatly. And if you could ask your company to help fund our, um, our work, if you're not comfortable doing that, we would love to get the contact information and then we could reach out and ask and um, share why, why it's so important. So, um, that's it for me. If you have any questions, I will be in the hallway track after the foundation is done here. And I would love to um, meet up and, and chat with all of you. So I am now going to um, stop sharing. This is always the hardest thing, right? Um, stop sharing and hand this off to Ed Mast, who is our uh, Senior Director of Technology. Uh, thanks, Deb. Um, in fact, uh, Joe's going to start off with a uh, summary of the projects that we have um, in progress, uh, the, the project grants, and I'll talk a little bit after that about our uh, roadmap and future plans. Okay, I'm going to attempt to share my screen here. Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah, you're fine. All right. Uh, Okay, can you see my screen? Not just yet, there we go. Okay, so good to go. Yeah, you're all set. Okay, so my plan is to tell you a bit about the work that uh, the foundation has been funding. Uh, so, uh, tell you a little bit about the work that the FreeBSD Foundation has been funding. And so this is external work. And by external work, I mean, uh, uh, somebody sending me messages and I'm hearing them in my headset. So if you're sending me direct messages, maybe uh, wait till after the presentation. So, <clears throat> uh, uh, so this is external work, so work that's done by contractors, so individuals or companies that are contracted by the foundation and not foundation employees. So here's a list of our current projects. So Moritz Systems has been contracted to improve uh, LLDB on FreeBSD. Uh, John Baldwin has been doing some work to uh, improve WireGuard support on FreeBSD. <coughs> uh, Bjorn Zeev has been working uh, to improve wireless support. Uh, a fresh contract that was just recently signed was with Zesper Chang so that he can 
uh, expand our OpenStack uh, support on FreeBSD. We also signed a new contract with John Baldwin, so he can dedicate a few hours of his time each month for uh, Beehive uh, work. Um, uh, this is a long-standing contract with Matt Ahrens to import uh, RAID Z expansion into the OpenZFS repository. And we're getting close to wrapping up a mini project by Pau Emma to explore how we can best update the, the handbook. Uh, so the LLDB project is a long-term project uh, that I think the first contract was uh, started around the end of 2022. And in a nutshell, this project is to improve LLDB support on FreeBSD. And, and one of the goals is to make it essentially feature complete relative to GDB. Um, Moritz Systems has done a fantastic job of documenting their work. So if you want a detailed description uh, of the work that they've been doing, you can head to their uh, site and read all about it. Um, maybe I'll list off a few of the deliverables just so you can get a taste of the type of work that they've been doing. So uh, bef before their work, the LLDB plugin model on BSD was obsolete and growing technical debt. So they replaced that uh, obsolete plugin with a modern uh, client server plugin layout. Uh, they implemented follow fork and follow vfork operations on par with GDB. They implemented save core functionality, support for debugging via serial port, improved GDB protocol compatibility, support for uh, kernel core dumps, uh, live kernel debugging, support for the nonstop variant of GDB remote serial uh, protocol, and what they're working on now is improving uh, multi-process debugging in LLD. Uh, the next uh, project that I'll talk about uh, is the project to improve WireGuard on FreeBSD. So uh, that, again, is work uh, that's been done by John Baldwin. And part of that work is to uh, support and add modern ciphers and uh, to add APIs so that uh, we can uh, the WireGuard module can reference our, our internal Cypher implementations rather than, or, or the OCF uh, uh, implementations in FreeBSD rather than the internal Cypher implementations in WireGuard. And I exchanged some emails with uh, DECA, uh, Bernard Fulik recently, and he tells me that the, uh, the latest uh, uh, FreeBSD or WireGuard KBAR port in the ports tree uh, uh, incorporates this OCF work by John. And uh, I've been running it for the last few days on my on my current system, and it, it seems great. Uh, Bjorn Zeev has been working on uh, improving wireless support, and um, much of the work that he's done uh, recently has been on the uh, 802.11 Linux KPI layer. And so the goal with that uh, work is is that he can take uh, newer drivers uh, from Linux and uh, incorporate them with little or no modification. And apparently that work is, uh, has been fruitful and we've just extended Bjorn's contract. So uh, for the next stage, he's gonna uh, focus on improving wireless speeds. Uh, the RAID Z expansion work has been um, uh, essentially done, I'd say that done, but the main development has been completed, but there's still an open pull request, and you can read uh, the comments on that pull request for a detailed uh, update. Uh, the latest news I have is that Mark Johnson has uh, integrated uh, that work in a local branch, and uh, I think Peter Holm is, is uh, involved with testing. So fingers crossed uh, that pull request will get merged soon, and we'll have a great set of functionality in OpenFS. Uh, so OpenStack is currently only unofficially supported on FreeBSD, and the goal of this, uh, this new contract is to have OpenStack components uh, expanded or extended so that FreeBSD can use OpenStack hosts. And uh, also for part of this, so if you're, if, if you, you could not uh, tag me on RC, please. Uh, it sends me a message to the uh, last couple seconds. Uh, so, also, so part of this um, uh, test wants to um, uh, 
set up for OPAC clusters. So uh, the first cluster is to support the work that uh, uh, Robert Watson's team is doing at the University of Cambridge. So they have to share a lot of different uh, rail boards uh, with uh, colleagues throughout the world. So, so uh, this OPSEC cluster uh, hopefully will be helpful for that work. He also plans to use an OSAC cluster for a uh, resource management system of the network cluster. And finally, the third OSAC cluster is going to include uh, reference machines for different FreeBSD grants and architectures that uh, hopefully will be helpful for uh, FreeBSD developers to their testing. Uh, some of the other work that's uh, uh, either ongoing or will start soon. Uh, as I mentioned, John Baldwin has been contracted just recently to use up to 10 hours of his time each month to deal with uh, uh, issues as they come up. Uh, so, uh, in particular, security issues, pressing issues, John will be able to give it time to tackle those. Uh, uh, we're interested in updating the handbook and how Emmett is uh, getting close to wrapping up his uh, mini projects to uh, determine how we can do that. So he sent out a survey, and he sent out survey results, and so we should have uh, uh, a plan for, for moving ahead with the handbook updates too. We're participating in a risk type mentorship, and most mentorship is we get a scholar working on uh, FreeSD Risk 5. So this is our, if you're not familiar, is a, is a fund that's pretty incredible. And um, uh, the first task for this, this mentorship is to get uh, uh, go targets supported, or free gift and respite targets supported uh, in Go. And I'm told that there's been some progress by both the student implements and free gift developers. I think uh, Mikael has said it's a progress. So, so we're hopeful that uh, apparently this very useful tool system will be available on previous years by the end of summer. Um, we're starting a... a hey Joe, uh, um, a you seem to be breaking up quite a bit. Uh, um, I don't know. If you want to leave uh, this, the slides uh, sure. sharing, I can talk to the last few points. If, uh, let's see. Oh, now we don't hear you at all. Um, so I'll, I'll talk to these. Um, you want to go over? I can. Um, so uh, we have a um, uh, effectively a GSOC style summer of code. Uh, um, uh, internship uh, program. This is a candidate who um, applied for the RISC-V um, uh, uh, project, but um, uh, we weren't able to accommodate them in the, the RISC-V uh, project. And so uh, we have a, a GSOC project, um, uh, an item that was in the GSOC uh, ideas list that they're going to be taking on uh, over the summer. Um, see here. Joe, do you want to put the uh, slide um, back up? Uh, otherwise, I'll just carry on with, uh, uh, with our roadmap topics. Joe's just about to rejoin, I think. So we'll wait for a couple of moments here. But otherwise, I will carry on with the, um, with the roadmap. So this is the um, technology roadmap that um, that you've probably seen before in uh, either previous summits or, or other venues, um, with with some minor updates um, as we've we've gone along. Um, but um, we, uh, generally speaking, 
this is sort of the, the roadmap we laid out um, a year and a half uh, ago and have um, generally kept with, um, with what we've uh, identified. Uh, and we're certainly interested in hearing feedback from the community um, and from the new uh, incoming core team uh, and, and other sources um, and corporate sponsors and, um, and FreeBSD downstream consumers and such about where um, our efforts ought to be focused and our, where our priorities should be. Um, as Joe mentioned, we're continuing to work with Bjorn um, on uh, Wi-Fi topics. Um, the, the next focus is really addressing um, speed and making it uh, usable at contemporary Wi-Fi um, uh, speeds. Uh, we have an open, um, for open, uh, uncommitted um, proposals or projects, uh, project ideas for continuing some uh, DRM uh, graphics driver support, uh, as well as looking at supporting the, the efforts on um, having a fully BSD licensed Linux KPI layer. Um, and this is one of the things that would be a prerequisite for bringing the uh, graphics drivers back into the um, into the base system. Uh, Scott Long had um, been looking at Thunderbolt 3 and USB 4, um, but looks like he will not be um, uh, able to complete that, that work. Um, I know HPS is, um, is interested in taking it on, um, but it's, it's something that's you know, of a very strong interest um, to us. And so we'll see if there's something we need to do uh, to support that. Um, we have a proposal, a uh, potential proposal coming in for some work on package base. Um, and I think at this point, uh, package base, uh, you know, it is uh, lots of work has been done um, to get package base to where it is. Uh, and there's, uh, there's just some integration and testing and uh, the, 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 uh, the 90% of the work has been done and now there's the remaining 90% uh, to do uh, in some sense. Uh, but uh, you know, we're, we're certainly interested in making sure that this comes to, uh, comes to fruition and are uh, investigating what we can do to support it. Um, someone has some feedback going, so can you please mute if you're not uh, speaking right now. Um, our commodity server uh, topic here is, um, this, this encompasses all of the work that we do to support x86 and ARM64, the tier one platforms uh, within FreeBSD, so ongoing bug fixes and general development, um, performance improvements, and uh, security vulnerability mitigations, hardware support, all of those sorts of things. Um, and that, that work will, will continue. Um, you can see on here that ARM64 as tier one continues until mid 2023, uh, as far as the roadmap is concerned. Um, and uh, the intent uh, with that is not that um, once we get through 20, you know, halfway through 2023, we no longer have an interest in, in ARM64 as tier one. Um, really, it is just that at that point, um, I think we will um, uh, we'll basically be finished with ARM64 as a unique aspect of being tier one and X80, uh, AMD64 and ARM64 will just be the, the sort of you know, general two tier one platforms um, and resources and effort and such will just be um, divided between them uh, as, as resourcing and, and uh, projects uh, see fit. Um, we have put some effort into um, supporting uh, CI and uh, uh, as, as uh, uh, Deb mentioned slightly, uh, or Deb mentioned briefly earlier, um, and uh, ongoing effort to bring release artifacts, gen release artifact generation through, um, through CI and, in supporting various release targets. Um, so that, that effort is ongoing and will continue. Um, we're focusing on proactive security. Um, so this includes things like capsicum, uh, use of capsicum, use of syscaller to, to find um, uh, issues uh, in advance of them becoming um, discovered in the, in the wild or, or uh, exploitable things that um, uh, we might run into. And uh, you can uh, you can come to the panel session on security later on to hear some more about those um, those topics. 
And then finally, um, VM scalability is a proposed uncommitted um, project with um, a tentative plan to look at um, improving um, scalability in the VM system. Uh, then uh, toolkit and appliance basically covers right now our development tools efforts. Um, so far, this has been largely the debugger support, um, which uh, as of uh, the completion of Moritz's um, current LLDB project um, that, that basically concludes the, the work that we um, we sort of require on LLDB to get to a, a, a compelling and, and uh, competent debugger in the base system. Uh, there may be additional um, uh, projects that we, we wish to support um, there, but, uh, but really getting to the point of having a usable quality debugger um, for our tier one architectures is, is the goal. And I think we are, um, uh, we're very close to that point um, now. Uh, we look to, um, we're looking at uh, the next projects um, in this area um, around performance tooling, um, ideally user-friendly uh, uh, interfaces or front ends for things like HTTP PMC. Uh, and then um, container work, um, this is something that's been uh, of interest for quite some time, um, and people have probably seen the work that Samuel Karp and Doug Rapson um, have been, been doing. Samuel Karp um, uh, started the RunJ project, and Doug Rapson has been using, building on top of that, um, exploring a number of the typical Linux um, containerization technologies, um, making them usable in the FreeBSD environment. Um, and so we are very interested in, in that work. Um, we've had uh, a call with, with Doug to kind of see, you know, where things are looking to go and what the foundation can do to help support that. And now that those things are becoming um, uh, very concrete, um, we expect to, um, uh, to put some development resources behind it as we, we identify uh, areas we can make a, um, valuable contribution. Um, and then very briefly at the end here, um, we have sort of two use cases that we wanted to use to drive uh, some of the focus on this. And so the framework laptop um, is, um, is one of these use cases that we want to try and use to highlight uh, or provide motivation for Wi-Fi work, um, installer work, and packaging package base. Um, and the intent is to sort of imagine the FreeBSD Foundation had a you know, standard uh, IT department and was, was producing a pre-imaged laptop for our own employees. Um, we want to use this as a the sort of um, the use case that says, here's what here's the image that we're going to put on it and here's how um, uh, this will be usable by our own own staff. And then from there, um, use that to figure out what um, what specific topics are and projects we, we um, should take on and uh, test and, and validate our integration efforts. And then finally, um, uh, for the uh, container um, effort, um, we're looking at um, looking at red ports, um, which was a uh, port CI system, um, and uh, seeing if we, we can sort of provide something akin to what it provide it it, uh, it used to provide um, using the containerization uh, technology that. Um, uh, various the, the various containerization projects that are, are in progress now. Um, so I'll stop my screen share. Um, we have a couple of questions, I think. So we'll see if there's anything here that we want to uh, we want to cover. Um, let's see. Uh, will the, will the slides be available later? Yes, the, the slides will be published. Um, uh, and. Uh, some questions here about um, uh, Wi-Fi and um, uh, future sort of Wi-Fi looking beyond Wi-Fi six, Wi-Fi seven, um, or AX, AY, etc. Um, I think at this point, our primary goal um, with the Wi-Fi work is to just get caught up to being contemporary. Um, you know, I think there's there's enough work that we need to do in the immediate term to to just get to where. Um, the state of the industry is right now. So that's our very much our first priority. Um, once we get past that point, uh, I think uh, understanding where, where things are going and, and how to um, avoid getting into the situation that we're in, um, in now is something that 
very much is is worth um, investigating. Um, and uh, another question here about risk five that I think we don't really have time to uh, to go into, but um, I think it's something we can uh, we can discuss in the uh, hallway track if uh, folks are so inclined. Um, so I think that is uh, that's it from what I'm looking to present. Okay, thank you, um, Deb, Joseph, and Ed. Uh, so I think we're up for our first break um, for the day. So if folks want to head over to the hallway track, we can talk more there. But otherwise, we'll be back here in about 30 minutes for a talk from Brooks Davis with an update on Sherry and ARM's new Morello architecture. I did more of the system. <laughs> Isn't that always the case, John, huh? As soon as you start talking, the phone rings. Yeah, case, uh, somebody's on Zoom. Yeah. Uh, somebody's on Zoom. DCH, I think you did.
Okay, everyone, welcome back from our first break. Um, <clears throat> so I was hanging out on the hallway track. We looks like I think we still had a couple of different discussions. Um, the last one I was in was talking about uh, scheduling on Alder Lake and dealing with kind of asymmetric cores and so forth. So I imagine we will have more discussions in the future. One suggestion that I think came up um, if you're going to if you wanted to talk about something in the hallway track, uh, one suggestion I want to make is go find a table and then create a little text box describing the topic you're going to talk about. It'll make it easier for people to figure out if they want to come over to your table or not without having to just kind of grab themselves and wander around listening in on everything. Um, and there's a, if you click plus, you can see when you're in the interface for the hallway track on spatial, if you click plus, you can see a list of tools and you can do a text box that way. Um, and please, no more Rick Rolls. Um, aside from that, our next talk is going to be from Brooks, giving an update on Cherry, which is something I have near and dear to my heart as well. I'm going to turn it over to Brooks. Hello. Um, yeah, I'm here today to talk to you about Cherry, what it is, um, what ARMS Morello um, CPU it is all about, and their prototype uh, implementing Cherry and then uh, talk a bit about the implications for FreeBSD. Um, we've been using FreeBSD uh, for Cherry development uh, through, throughout the entire project. And right now, FreeBSD has a potential lead um, in terms of Cherry adoption and that we are the only really full featured platform uh, with Cherry support. So I'm gonna go ahead and get started. So what is Cherry? Cherry is, nominally uh, capability hardware extended risk instructions. Um, it's a new hardware technology that mitigates security vulnerabilities. And uh, Cambridge SRI and a bunch of uh, collaborators have been working on it uh, for over a decade now. Uh, we started collaborating with ARM um, in 2014. And then in 2019, it actually became public um, that, that we had been doing this. and the ARM Morello platform was announced with support from uh, the UK government's UK, uh, UKRI, UK Research Institute in Initiative, I believe. Um, so in today's talk, I'm gonna talk about why we developed Cherry, what Cherry is and how does it work, um, the sort of software you can run on it, what sort of, a, I'll talk a bit about some security evaluations that have been uh, done on Cherry, and then talk a bit about uh, Cherry and FreeBSD and uh, try to spark some discussion on how to move forward. So why develop Cherry? Well, we've had buffer overflows forever. Um, and as this quote here uh, at the top says, we've, you know, we haven't done, we've basically done nothing to improve the situation in the last 40 years. We have neat tools like address sanitizer and, their, and its predecessors. Um, we have static analysis. And yet fundamentally, buffer overflows are still everywhere. Um, and if anything, their impact is worse than before um, in our increasingly connected world. Um, in, a, in a talk by uh, Matt Miller at uh, the Microsoft Security Response Center um, a, a few years ago, he said that 70% of their vulnerabilities that require patches are uh, memory safety bugs. And spatial memory safety is the first, the first of those, um, followed by use after free bugs. So that's really bad. Um, and we really haven't made much progress. We've had a number of, we have a number of neat diagnostic tools, but most of them can't be run at, uh, at can't be used at runtime or in deployment. So they're not, we, we don't actually solve the problem. You know, if we catch, if the developers catch the bug, great, but if they don't, it's out there and it, it impacts people. So, so here's, a, here's an example of things that go wrong. You probably all remember Heartbleed. Um, you know, one of the first vulnerabilities with a logo um, is, now it, has, is now required. Um, and you know, the, the way it worked is there was a, a heartbeat message um, where a client would send to the server, you know, hey, are you still there? Send me potato, it's six letters um, or something like that. Or, you know, send me bird, it's four letters. But then, what if you sent, um, you know, send me hat, it's 500 letters. Well, the server would send you hat and then whatever was laying around in a buffer. Um, and in this case here, 
Um, if you look very closely, it is, you know, some stuff in the buffer and please change the user's password um, to this. So, you know, that, that seems like something you don't want to happen. Well, what went wrong here and how can we do better? The classical answer to what went wrong is that the programmer made an error and they should make the one line bug fix. And this is all well and good, but we know this isn't working. Our answer with Cherry is to preserve the bounds information of the program during compilation and project it all the way down to the hardware where we can use Cherry to detect that there was an overrun and um, an abort rather than leaking information. So here's another example. So this is another sort of a general problem. So software attack surface just keeps getting bigger. This is because applications are larger, large in many cases because they're more complicated, but also because they're using huge libraries to aid rapid development. They're using multiple programming languages because one is better suited to part of the part of the job than another. And then of course, everything's networked. And in fact, you know, your browser is, is a distributed system. Um, so, you know, everything is just super complicated. Um, this aids the attacker. It gives them a whole new error, number of ways to break in and a whole, whole set of things to exploit. Um, you know, you, you have, have things like when you have a Java virtual machine, or not a, well, not a JVM anymore, but sorry, a JavaScript virtual machine, um, that allows you to write code to attack the software um, and, for instance, break things like address-based layout randomization. So the Cherry solution is to implement least privilege at the application level. We do this um, using software compartmentalization. Now, software compartmentalization is an old idea. It's been around for a long time. You know, you see examples like the PrivCEP code in um, the, the, the PrivCEP code in OpenSSH, or the fact that in modern Chrome and Firefox, all your tabs run in separate processes. So at least getting from one to another is quite challenging. Um, but with Cherry, we can make a lot more compartments. So we, we, uh, that, that gives us a big benefit in terms of being able to isolate potentially buggy code. Uh, we believe we can create a couple orders of magnitude more, more compartments potentially. Um, and one neat thing about compartmentalization is that not only can it, can it uh, mitigate vulnerabilities you don't know about, it can mitigate entire classes of vulnerabilities you don't know about. It's one of the only techniques that we know of that has this sort of potential. Um, let's see, I got a couple of questions here. Um, so the first question is, um, would bounds checking language is like Ada or Rust help here? The answer is yes, but in many cases, um, but in, well, in many cases, we have existing software. We have over 20 billion lines of open source C and C++ code in the world. Um, we're not going to rewrite it all immediately. So there's a, there's a huge time lag in terms of being able to fix problems that way. Um, secondly, things like Rust have unsafe mode. Um, so, or are they, to, to be able to implement things that the language can't express, like linked lists, or um, they have a foreign function interface. So turns out there's some bits you don't want to implement and there's a C implementation, so you use it. Um, it'd be nice if we could make those safe. Um, there's a second question here. Um, can Cherry capabilities replace the paging MMU? And the answer is yes, potentially, um, but existing software won't work well, and is, is unlikely to just move to that environment with no work. Um, something where we have done in uh, some embedded operating systems. And I'll talk a little bit more about some work where we're doing a sort of a lightweight version of that for uh, compartmentalization. So Cherry upholds a couple uh, principles. First, the principle of intentional use. The idea here is that you convey, that the, that the software developer conveys their, their intention to the, to the language and that intention is carried on down. And when you do something, when you take some action, you do it with, um, with the object that you meant to work on, not with just an address somewhere um, that you made up, uh, for instance. And the second is the principle of least privilege. So this both 
um, happens writ small with bounds on uh, buffers and also writ large, uh, writ larger with software compartmentalization. So software compartmentalization can reduce attack surfaces, mitigate exploits, and we have extremely scalable um, and efficient compartmentalization with Cherry. Now, let me talk a bit about what Cherry actually does. Um, Cherry adds a new hardware type, the capability. A Cherry capability is a bounds checked pointer with integrity properties. It's held in memory and in extended registers. Um, it takes the address and it adds uh, permissions and compressed bounds, as well as um, a sealed bit, uh, which, makes, which can make the uh, capability unmanipulatable. And then that takes up 128 bits. And then we add a single, an additional bit off to the side, um, which indicates validity or integrity. Um, this tag is a key is key because it means that if you manipulate, if you try to manipulate the capability bits without using a capability aware instruction, the tag will be cleared and it will be destroyed. Likewise, if you perform an invalid manipulation, um, for instance, you try to increase the bounds, the tag will be lost. So here's a, here's a little example of the capability pointing um, into a range of memory. Um, so capabilities here can be used to replace pointers. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about how the primitives are uh, put together to, uh, 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 to, to make this all work. Um, I see I have a question here is where is the, where is the integrity tag stored? Uh, there's two answers to this question, depending on your implementation. Um, one, in one model, you simply store it next to the, uh, you store it right next to the um, capability in memory and the memory controller hides it from you. The other option is that you store it in a separate set of memory, all, like also the memory controller hides it, hides it or uh, prevents access to it. And then there's a tag cache in that case um, to avoid extra DRAM traffic. So in terms of the processor uh, primitives, um, so first of all, Cherry is an architectural, Cherry capabilities are an architectural primitive. And they're used by software, by compilers, by software and applications to constrain the future um, execution of a process. Um, that's implemented with a microarchitecture. The, the microarchitecture um, ensures that the data types are correct, that the tag and the tag memory, um, the tag is maintained, and it enforces various manipulation properties. And then the software refines capabilities um, to have meaning relative to the programming language. So, and to express the programmer's meaning, uh, the programmer's intent. So there's basically two applications of these primitives that I've kind of talked about before, but I'll talk about again because it's important. Um, so there's, there's efficient fine-grained memory protection for languages like C and C++. There's also this, we provide strong source level compatibility with recompilation, but recompilation is required to get any benefit. Um, our protections are deterministic. They don't depend on, um, on entropy, so they don't detect, they don't depend on on, on random layout or um, a hash value like like uh, the uh, pack pointer integrity uh, codes or pointer authentication codes uh, from ARM. And in, and and so this is a really key thing. We strive for determinism, and we just try, so we believe that will both give us better debugability and better security because we don't have to worry about for instance, speculative execution bypassing, um, bypassing our protections. We don't have to worry about it very much anyway. Um, in, a, in a few uh, retrospective studies that I'll talk about a bit more later, um, about two thirds of vulnerabilities can be mitigated by simply applying Cherry um, for, for bounds and overhead's fairly modest. Um, for most real world use cases, we're talking zero to 5%. Um, some extremely pointer dense workloads, benchmarks where um, everything you're doing is basically walking a tree of pointers, um, overheads may be a bit higher. But I don't really, I'm not focusing on the performance in this talk. 
Um, there's, we also have scalable software compartmentalization. Um, there's a lot of different models um, that could be applied. Um, and we'll talk a bit about which ones, uh, which, which ones that uh, we're gonna, we're gonna deal with, we're gonna, uh, we're exploring at the moment. Um, the big thing that uh, software compartmentalization does is that it increases the exploit chain length um, and that, uh, and makes it harder for uh, attackers to get from wherever it is they get a toehold down to whatever it is they want to do. Um, and we, we believe, and early, in, early benchmarks show, that we can get orders of magnitude improvement over MMU-based uh, compartmentalization, which is to say process-based compartmentalization. Um, I see I have a question about speculative execution. I think I will punt that to the end and we can talk about it uh, uh, either offline or at the end. So here's a quick summary of how the memory protection works. Um, use capabilities to partition your memory, um, your, your address space. So uh, capabilities, integrity and providence properties um, ensure that you can't make one out of nothing. Um, you have to derive one from another. Bounds mean that if you have one allocation, you can't use it to get to another unrelated allocation. And monotonicity means that you can't go from an allocation uh, from a sub allocation to the larger piece um, that it came from. Next, that was, that was talking about data. Now here's code. The same properties um, apply to code, to code pointers. Um, and, per, and the permissions ensure that you can't turn a data capability into a code capability. Um, and uh, so, so it's, yeah. So, so the, the key thing here is that software reduces pointer permissions um, during execution. And this is all, all of this put together is the foundation for higher level things such as uh, software compartmentalization. So compartmentalization scalability. We dramatically improve scalability because we don't have to go through the kernel and swap your whole um, page table or you know, exchange your page tables and, and, and whatnot. We don't have to blow your uh, TLB uh, cache and, and that sort of thing. So we can allow more compartments. Um, we think one or two orders of magnitude more. We can allow faster and more frequent domain transitions between compartments. Um, because all we're doing is transforming the register set um, and faster shared memory because we can share the same address space um, and both look into the same buffer. There are all sorts of complications about memory ownership, but, that is, but we can still nonetheless do that. Now, there's a lot of potential use cases. An obvious one is that we'd like to sandbox every piece of multimedia stuff in a, in a web browser. Um, Firefox has done a bit of this with its RL box work. Um, but uh, we can be, we can run native code rather than being forced to use WebAssembly, um, which also has the problem that it has no, no bounds internally. Um, and then on, it is worth pointing out though that while compartmentalization is a huge benefit for Cherry, unlike memory protection, software compartmentalization does require refactoring your, of your code. Um, the memory protection requires a few changes generally quite modest. Um, and I'll talk a bit more about one study of it uh, later. But compartmentalization actually requires you, that you change the coupling of your software. So that's, that's a definite uh, issue. So now I'm gonna talk about the prototype stack that we have for Cherry and Morello. Um, this, is, this is both software that we've developed at uh, Cambridge and SRI um, and also uh, software that ARM has de developed in-house in or uh, with help from Lenaro. So we have a, we have a complete stack um, all the way from bare metal up. We have compilers, tool chains, debuggers, hypervisors, um, OSs and applications. So at the, the core, we have, we have a, the tool chain bits. Um, the, the Cherry project uh, built the LLVM, LLVM and Clang work and uh, John, John Baldwin did the did GDB. We supported MIPS initially, although we've now deprecated that support. Now we support RISC-V. ARM took that and built on top of it uh, to build Morello support. On top of that, um, we have a whole software stack of CherryBSD um, ported to RISC-V and Morello. This is 
Cherry, this is FreeBSD adapted to Cherry. I'll talk a bit more about it on the next slide. And then we have an op, we have a, an application stack. So we have a, a slice of X11 and KDE working. Um, we have WebKit, um, which is the basis um, one way or another for most modern web browsers. Um, we have, and we have a bunch of basic software like Python, OpenSSH, Nginx, Postgres uh, working. So Cherry BSD, it's, you know, as I say, it's free BSD adapted to Cherry. Um, from a user perspective, the big thing, the big changes are we have a new ABI, Cherry ABI, um, where all pointers are Cherry capabilities. And this includes, um, so, and this includes the pointers used to make system calls. And in fact, the kernel only accesses user space memory through capabilities. Um, you can uh, learn a bit more about that if you go and listen to my BSD CAN talk, or if you already have, um, or I should be giving it at uh, EuroBSD CAN uh, in September. Um, it's also a new compatibility ABI. Um, this is FreeBSD 64. It supports conventional um, RISC-V 64 and ARC 64 uh, binaries, as well as hybrid ones where some pointers are capabilities. You can think of it as an analog to FreeBSD 32. Um, it works basically the same way. And I've made a lot of improvements to FreeBSD 32 um, as a result of doing the FreeBSD 64 work in Cherry BSD. Um, our kernel can be either a hybrid program um, where only some pointers are capabilities, or it can be a pure capability program where all pointers are capabilities. Um, we started out with hybrid um, in large part because we didn't really have adequate compiler support when we started out. Um, and, uh, and we've since uh, done peer capability support um, with, uh, with help of a grad student, uh, Alfredo, who has really, uh, who's done not only peer capability support, but uh, supported sub-object bounds, which is to say putting the bounds on uh, things like an array within a structure um, for extra protection. We have uh, Panfrost GPU support. Um, uh, Roslyn has it working on his desk and this is all peer capability. So all pointers are capabilities, um, uh, both in the kernel and in user space. We have OpenGL up and running. Uh, we now need to get it landed into our main tree. Um, and similarly, Andy's uh, work on Beehive for ARM64, um, he's built on top of that uh, to add Morello support. Um, so that we can add, so that we can run Cherry BSD uh, in a VM, and that's the motivation for the uh, uh, OpenStack work that uh, uh, was talked about earlier. Where uh, so we we have about thirty uh, Morello boxes that are going to be put in a data center in Cambridge, and we hope to be able to hand out VMs to interested developers in the not too distant future. So now I'm going to talk a bit about a couple security analyses of Cherry. First, there's a one that's a couple of years old from the Microsoft Security Response Center. Um, they looked at critical memory safety vulnerabilities um, with the metric, does it pose a risk to customers and thus require a software update? They consider mitigated vulnerabilities that crash not to require a software update. They can be fixed later um, as part of a normal upgrade process um, rather than you know, as a patch Tuesday sort of thing. So they wanted to know, Basically, how many patch Tuesdays can we avoid? Um, so they have a blog post and a long report looking at uh, uh, analyzing vulnerabilities for spatial safety. Um, and they did a bit of a sort of paper and pencil analysis of temporal safety work um, because the baseline they were using didn't have that. And then they also red teamed some specific bits of cherry, um, found a few bugs for us, quite helpful. Um, and they said Cherry, the, the, the bottom line though, is that Cherry in, it, in its current state would deterministically mitigate about two thirds of the issues that they had to patch. So uh, we find that very promising. Um, another study was performed by Capabilities Limited. This is uh, Robert Watson and Ben Laurie's uh, consultancy. Um, and they looked at building an open source desktop for Morello. They did this on QEMU because that's what was available at the time. They selected a slice of applications, um, X11, QT, and KDE and a few, uh, a few applications. They implemented um, referential and spatial safety. And then they also whiteboarded some compartmentalization um, to see where you, where you could get a bit farther if you did a little bit of compartmentalization. Um, 
They also evaluated the lines of code change, which I think a lot of people will be interested in, um, and then did a retrospective and a vulnerability analysis, much like the Microsoft one, although they just considered any vulnerability that was published. And there's a, there's a report online. Um, the key outcomes, they looked at 6 million lines of code and compiled it, um, and they did three case studies on compartmentalization. The lines of code modification changes are fantastic. We're looking at less than 0.03% uh, lines of code had to be changed. And in, a, in fact, many of these changes were changes to add cross-building support um, or to fix broken cross-building support, not actual changes to the C code, um, which, was, which is really, really nice. Um, and again, they got about, they got 73% or so uh, mitigation rate using a combination of memory safety and hypothetical compartmentalization. Um, so that's, that's quite promising in terms of reducing the number of advisories and uh, hopefully with compartmentalization, improving availability. Um, one of the things that they noted doing the uh, retrospective study um, was that a lot of security advisories or security patches were for denial of service in uh, user applications, uh, which is a bit of a different model than Microsoft, um, than the, the Microsoft vulnerabilities. And so that, that, that uh, implies a, a strong interest in allowing things to stay up and compartmentalization could help with availability. So where to learn more? Well, we have our, our project page, cherrycpe.org. We also have um, cherrybsd.org, where in fact our latest release is available. Um, and there's links to documentation. We have an introduction to Cherry. We now have a, not, not listed here, but a, a new uh, CherryBSD getting started guide. Um, the most recent published version of our ISA spec is available. Um, and we have a C and C++ programming guide. Um, for people to, under, to, to start to learn how to program uh, to Cherry and how to modify their programs. So I'm gonna use a couple of slides from ARM uh, to talk about the Morello program. This is part of the Digital Security by Design um, initiative in the UK. And ARM is interested in making fundamental breakthroughs in security. So they, that's what got them interested in Morello um, or in, in Cherry. Um, and led to this Morello program. The, the basic issue is that we keep, you know, bandaging things and the bandages work for a while and then the hackers figure out how to get around them and it, we keep doing this. Um, and we don't, we often don't have an appetite for big hardware changes. Um, so we get things that are, that can be done cheaply and are low commitment. Um, and then we find out if they work. For something like Cherry, it's a bigger deal. And so we're trying to, to break, the, break the deadlock between the hardware and the software people, where the software people are not gonna put work into um, building, building software or modifying software for a new environment if they don't know that it will be built. And the hardware people don't want to build hardware that the software people won't, won't use because that's expensive. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about what's going on. So, Here's a slide basically just showing there's a lot of ARM processors, um, really, truly ridiculous numbers. Um, I think it's, I think the 25 billion uh, chips shipped in 2022, um, that's, that comes out to like hundreds a second. Um, it's kind of ridiculous. So they want to, they want to change all of these processors and make them all better. So Morello is, um, so Morello is, is the cool bit. We've got, we've now got this implementation of Cherry. It runs at a reasonable clock rate. Um, you can build world on it in a reasonable amount of time. Um, I've got one on my desk right next to me right now um, that just arrived last week. It's super exciting. Um, the, so, so that's, now we can actually really test Cherry at scale and do a lot more work there. So what is ARM? A, hope to achieve with this program? Well, they're hoping um, to reduce the number of, of security vulnerabilities tremendously. Um, they, have, they know they have a bunch of partners who are interested in Cherry, um, but at the end of the day, they need somebody to, to commit, who can solve, who can you know, sell hundreds of millions of processors a year, or better yet, billions. Um, so they need a customer. And Morello is, 
is a prototype to help get feedback on the architecture and figure out if customers are willing to say yes. Um, the, what, what, what does success look like here? Well, it's people find Morello compelling. They find that it addresses security challenges and that they believe they can deploy it. Um, and the hope is that this leads to cherry technologies in ARM processors and also other processors. Um, ARM, we, our, our work with ARM is under an agreement where we're, we, we are careful to ensure that none of the critical bits of Cherry, uh, the, what, we, what we call the capability essential IP, um, will be patented in such a way that somebody else can't build it. So that means that a RISC-V standard could happen. And it's really important to us and to ARM because we know that if, you know, that our ARM knows that if they have a weird processor um, with weird extensions that requires a different compiler, that's not necessarily going to fly. But if there's multiple players, um, then it can all work and they can all share the load. Um, so let's see. Yeah. So here's a timeline of the Cherry project. Um, this chart is getting increasingly crowded and we need to make it slightly taller again, I think. Um, so that we have any hope of reading it. Uh, we've been at it for uh, over 20 years now, or sorry, over 10 years now. And in fact, over 150 researcher hours um, have been put into it. So it's, it's a really big project. Um, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about FreeBSD things. So we have been up, upstreaming things. Um, we, we've been upstreaming changes uh, to free, from CherryBSD to FreeBSD. Um, wherever practical, wherever it makes sense. Um, so we do we upstream any sort of obvious improvements to the baseline um, because we don't want to maintain those diffs. And we also um, and and sometimes we update upstream refactorings that are you know maybe neutral but help us. So we've been trying to do that. Um, there is a question though. Um, now that we have real hardware, although not for a production ISA, at what point should we upstream Cherry? Um, I think it would be really helpful in terms of showing, showing a community commitment to Cherry. Um, and it would, allow, it would allow CI to cover Cherry specific issues. Um, although we don't actually see a lot of problem, a lot of cases where FreeBSD developers make changes that, that break Cherry code. So that is actually quite, not quite good and quite promising. Um, but nonetheless, it would be nice to have things in CI. Um, the downside is right now there is no non-prototype architecture. So we've got Morello. Um, Morello. Morello is in an encoding space that can't probably can't be used for production. Um, and then ARM will have, so it'll, it'll definitely be re-encoded if it becomes a real thing. Um, and likewise, RISC-V, I think our encoding space has already been stomped on um, and we would need something standardized upstream before we could consider doing anything. And also ports. So we actually recently started a fork of ports um, to develop ports for uh, for Cherry BSD. So we build hybrid. We do both hybrid packages, which is to say conventional ARC sixty four packages, and um, and uh, and and Cherry ABI packages. So with the hybrid packages, um, we're installing them in an alternate in an alternate location. And we have wrappers to package so that you can install install both into both uh, you install both types of things because there would be conflicts. That we decided the easiest path was to have a package sixty four and a package sixty four C, um, where the where the latter is the capability one, um, and to use a different local base, a different directory in var, et cetera. Um, we are seeing a, quite a bit of breakage um, due to local base being in the wrong place. So we're Building, I think, about twenty-three thousand packages at the moment out of thirty something. Um, so there's there's a number of things broken or blocked. Um, what we would like feedback on is what sort of changes would be acceptable upstream. I, th I think local base not equal user local, presumably. Um, I've also one I ran into yesterday was that um, we sometimes have excess dependencies when you disable docs, um, so we depend on 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 the doc bits um, always. There's probably other things that are sort of general. So I'd like to get feedback uh, on that. 
And then I'd like to talk a bit about implications of Cherry and CherryBSD to the FreeBSD project. Right now, CherryBSD is the only practical development environment for Cherry software. Um, ARM has Android and Linux ports, but they're not like a full production system. They're, you know, they're a kernel here and, a, and muscle there and, and various bits. Um, and they don't have a real peer capability runtime yet and, and that sort of thing. Um, that was, that is made possible by FreeBSD's integrated base system. And it turns out our use of Clang was really critical. Um, and ports has actually been really helpful. So we've been able to build about 8,000 Cherry IBI packages. Maybe we're to 9,000 now. Um, I forgot to check this morning. Um, so having integration is really helpful for us. And it's really benefited um, our work on Cherry BSD. Um, but the question is, how can FreeBSD, now that we, while we have this lead, can we maintain it? Can we exploit it um, to grow the project? I'd really like to do that. I'd like to see, I'd like us to think about how as a project we can do that. So some conclusions. Um, cherry protections are deterministic and solve fundamental security issues. Um, Cherry provides hardware, provides the hardware with what it, with more of the programmer's intent. We don't strip it all away every time we do a memory access by just turning it into an integer. Um, this is helps with the principle of intentionality. Um, we have pointer integrity and bounds checking um, that defeat a lot of conventional exploits. Uh, we basically eliminate buffer overflows and we provide scalable, efficient compartmentalization. This is a bit of a work in progress, but that is our intent. Um, and this allows least privilege um, to mitigate both known and unknown attacks. FreeBSD is playing a major role here, and I'd really like to see how we can keep it going. Um, I'm going to go ahead and scroll back and start answering some more questions. Um, let's see. Uh, let's see. Can Cherry be used to implement call gates without system calls? Um, Cherry can be used to do um, domain transition without, without system calls. Um, how would the overhead of a Cherry only operating system compare to a common MMU approach? Honestly, I have no idea um, because we don't have performant hardware without, um, without MMUs. So it's, a, it's not really an easily answerable question. Um, I think we are interested in, in looking at single address space Unix, um, but uh, we have not gotten there. Uh, let's see. So how, how, would, how would FreeBSD run Cherry regression tests? Is there an emulator? Um, yeah, so we do have a QEMU emulator. Um, we, have, we, we run regression tests, um, including the, the uh, FreeBSD ones in QEMU. Running the whole set in QEMU takes quite a while, um, eight hours or something, if I remember right. Uh, let's see, which ports require the most patching? Um, I don't think we've ported enough, enough uh, software. We haven't shoved enough software into ports to really come to a conclusive uh, answer to that question. Um, there's some software we'll probably, we won't port. For instance, we're not gonna port obsolete compilers um, forward. And it looks like, John's going to answer this one. And then, um, but uh, yeah, we're, we have some interest in, in sort of, in, we're, well, we want to greatly expand the amount of software ported to Cherry, to, uh, Cherry ABI, and uh, we're, we're working on that. Let's see. Is Cherry used inside the kernel or just user space? Um, so, so the Cherry user space is a pure, is a pure capability user space um, by default in, in, our, in our releases. The kernel can either be a pure capability user space or a hybrid user space. In the hybrid mode, um, Cherry, let's see, in, 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 a hybrid, in the hybrid mode, all pointers to user space um, are capabilities. So that's why it is so, why, why our diff is quite large is that um, in, in overall is that we have to annotate every, every variable that could be from user space. Um, I think if we were to upstream CherryBSD, we would almost certainly 
start by upstreaming pure capability only because it's much less disruptive. Um, one of the interesting aspects of having all user space access be via capabilities is that we actually put bounds or potentially put bounds on um, buffers from six, standard 64-bit programs. So, so things in the hybrid ABI. And uh, there are actually some cases where that can mit mitigate exploits like against the kernel um, because we know, because we have the system, syscall boundary manufacture a capability and uh, bound it. Let's see, uh, going back to speculation. Well, so I, I am not, I'm not the author of the work on uh, speculation. Um, we have a paper that hopefully should, well, that is in revision at the moment um, that talks about some work on speculation. Uh, the main thing is that you can, with, with Cherry, you can speculate a bit more than would otherwise be safe because you have bounds. So you can make sure that you, you speculate only on addresses you could reach um, because the information's right there. You don't have to go digging around to find it somewhere. Um, but you do have to be sure that you don't um, speculatively man manufacture a capability that you shouldn't be able to. So there's there's a work there. It is it's a microarchitecture problem basically. Can capabilities replace pointer plus size pairs in some system calls? Um, because of the compressed bounds, no. Because um, for a sufficiently large object, the uh, the the capability will be um, will have to be uh, slightly larger than you than requested. So the the num the size won't be right. Uh, that size on Morello is, I think, something like sixteen k. Um, that you if you have funny shaped things over sixteen k or so, um, that uh, they will need to become, for instance, word granularity or one big enough page granularity. So allocators need to need to be altered to add padding um, to, to, to handle that, uh, that rounding. There's one question from Renee still, I think, about um, bounds checking in languages like Ada or Rust and how that interacts with Cherry. Sure, I, to speak I, to that. I think I answered it a bit, but I'll speak to it a little more. Okay. Um, yeah, so in a, in, a, in a language with complete bounds checking and a runtime not written in C, um, you know, they, you might not need Cherry at all. Um, but in but Rust has a number of cases where it, it's forced to fall back to um, where, where, where it's forced to fall back to runtime bounds checking, which is expensive. Um, it also has unsafe mode um, where you can just manufacture capabilities out of where you can you can potentially manufacture pointers out of nowhere. Um, there was a long, 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 long chat thread and several uh, other and and. GitHub issues and all sorts of things recently about adding strict provenance to the language um, to be a step towards making it work with Cherry. Um, so that's a, yeah, so that, that um, the answer is I think something like Rust would benefit. Also, um, we've done some work um, quite a while back with Java, um, where if you look at a Java virtual machine, it has a million lines of C code in it. Um, for one reason or another, whether support bits or 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 whatnot, um, and so we can use Cherry to make this to um, extend Java's protections into the C layer and put bounds on things that the C layer is manipulating. So you can get a stronger uh, environment that way. Um, and I guess a funny, not really Cherry related story. Uh, there was an announcement recently about how um, the the Oracle JVM had a had rewritten some crypto code um, to, and it turns out it didn't verify signatures correctly. Um, 
And they'd rewritten it from C to Java. And it turns out because they didn't run the test suite, um, they had completely broken signature verification and made everything worse with the rewrite. So that's a, a risk of a complete rewrite there. Um, and, and a reason why you might want to just use Cherry and protect yourself uh, instead, because our changes are much smaller. Um, so let's see, a question about, uh, is, is the compression of capabilities similar to floating point? Uh, the answer is yes. Um, it's, uh, yeah, there's a, there, there's an exponent. There's a long paper called uh, Cherry Concentrate um, that talks about it in um, probably more detail than anyone would ever want to know who wasn't an implementer. Um, the, uh, I think, I'm not sure if we actually issued a revised one. ARM used it to implement uh, the Morello capabilities and I think found a couple bugs. Let's see, another question. For existing code bases, um, what, what can Cherry offer over, um, over things like PAC um, and simpler additions for fast bound checking? Um, so Cherry provides, well, so Cherry, Cherry provides um, strong integrity of the pointers themselves um, and would, for instance, probably probably break the existing the the recent attacks on PAC um, because you can't just make up you can't just go around make up making up capabilities. I believe you could if you wanted a little more flow control than we currently have. Um, if you to, wanted to defeat a gadget that could find that could farm capabilities and try them, um, or at least make it much harder to build one. Um, you could probably combine Cherry with PAC. Um, Morello is based on ARMv8.2, which doesn't have PAC. So um, it's not something that I think ARM has looked at in any detail. I don't know what their future plans are there. Um, for things like MTEs, bounds checking, um, they are fast, but current implementations um, are delayed or, or only fast if you use them asynchronously. So you have to, uh, you only find out if you've had a bounds violation when you hit the kernel boundary. Um, so that is not practical. That's not, that's not believed to be a fundamental limitation of MTE, but it's still a limitation. Um, there's also the problem that with MTE um, to get um, bounds, the, you, you can take an MTE pointer of a particular color and you can write to any memory of that color, whether it's adjacent or not. Um, so there's a statistical aspect there um, rather than being deterministic. Um, we do have some interest in the ways MTE can interact with Cherry um, and potentially help us do temporal safety. Um, looks like we are out of questions. Yep. So thank you very much, Brooks, um, for your talk. I mean, I'm incredibly biased since I work on it too. Um, thank you again. So I think we're going to go to our next break. Um, if folks want to go wander over to the hallway track. If we have more questions for Brooks, you can probably talk to Brooks there um, about more stuff with Cherry. Uh, yeah, sounds, all right. Sounds good. I will go move to. I will go move to a platform. <laughs> okay. So we'll be back in about uh, 25 minutes or so now to talk about pre-commit CI, which I think is going to be more of a roundtable discussion led by Warner and Ed. So we'll see you all then.
Okay, everyone, welcome back. Uh, for our next session, we're gonna have more of a round table discussion, I think, um, that's gonna be hosted by uh, Ed Nest and Warner Losh. So I'm gonna turn it over to Ed and Warner um, to talk specifically about pre-commit CI, I should say that part. All right, thanks, John. Um, so I'm gonna drive the slides and I think Warner is going to um, talk through the, um, the early parts here. And I have a bit of discussion on um, as one of our specific uh, implementations. Yeah, that's uh, the plan. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, so um, Ed and I have put together a kind of a working group for the continuous integration. Um, we've had some good uh, progress in improving our workflow since we've uh, adopted Git. Uh, and those efforts have uh, stalled a little bit lately. Uh, I have uh, was leading some meetings and it was just a bunch of people talking and we never really were accomplishing anything. So I stopped doing that. Um, and we're hoping to jumpstart the process by focusing on one aspect of things, namely our um, continuous integration strategy and how we can uh, improve continuous integration coverage um, from the current post commit stuff we have to um, pre commit um, and how we can uh, you know, deal with that. Um, this talk will also talk um, about um, the current solutions that are in FreeBSD. Ed will be talking about that as well as. Um, some examples of how individuals can use that uh, as well, and a roadmap, and then a roundtable discussion at the end. Next slide, please. Um, and again, the, the 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 main motivation is we need to engage more people or new people to uh, do this work. Um, there's a lot of people with uh, expertise in this area, but they haven't been um, they haven't been showing up, and so we were hoping to. Uh, say, hey, we're trying to get this going and uh, kind of flip the bits in people's mind from, hey, nothing's happening to you, something's happening and I wanna be part of that. Um, in general, there's been really widespread support for doing something like this. There's a few people who are unsure or, um, you know, they're used to the old ways and they're not sure what pre-commit CI would uh, buy for them. But by and large, people really want this. Um, we just have uh, suffered from a lack of people willing to uh, work on it and be committed to working on it. Um, and you know, our, we, we do currently have CI in the project. It's primarily post commit. If you break something, you'll get email. Um, and there's a, a number of ways that people can also opt in to do pre-commit things. Um, Ed has set up uh, Sarah CI. He'll talk about that here in a couple of minutes. Um, but the testing that it does is uh, more of a smoke test, you know, just, hey, did it work or not? Not, uh, is it fully functional and does it meet all the specs and so forth? And so we'd like to um, uh, transition uh, from, you know, the current minimal bare bones to uh, something a little bit more substantial. Uh, and before we get started, we also have to um, acknowledge that, you know, FreeBSD is special and different here. I know that um, there's a lot of people who have had, um, you know, who think that, you know, FreeBSD does their own thing and uh, it shouldn't. And in a lot of time, cases, you know, th that's a fair point, but when you're QAing a full OS, that's hard. Linux full QA system um, has been uh, years in the making and just started more recently. And so we should expect to have to uh, build it out incrementally. Um, we're not gonna have something that's perfect out of the gate, but we really, um, we really don't want the, um, let the perfect be the enemy of the good or the perfect of, be the enemy of the improved. Um, so we're hoping to make incremental changes that uh, improve things for everybody. Uh, next slide, please. So at a lower level, why do we wanna do pre-commit CI? If all the testing is done in post-commit, well, why does it matter? Well, um, if you do your testing before you commit, that 
greatly reduces the number of bugs that make it into the system. That greatly reduces the number of regressions. And so if we can force that to be done up front, a number of, at least the common breakages will be avoided. Everybody who's been a developer and has pulled the FreeBSD source tree has had the experience at least once of checking out all the sources, typing make, and it doesn't build and going, okay, is that a, a bug in the upgrade? Is that something weird on my system? Is that just something somebody broke in the tree and you don't know and you get defocused from the thing you were going to do with the build into now debugging the build? And so if we can get you know, the build breakages um, taken care of to as large an extent as possible, um, that will also help our developers make more efficient use of the time they have for the project, which sometimes can be quite limited. Uh, and it will, um, but, but to get all the benefits from this, we're gonna have to further evolve the project's um, <laughs> workflow so that um, people get used to, rather than uh, I make a change, I commit, I push, which was kind of the old uh, subversion, old CVS workflow into, well, I make a series of changes, maybe on a branch and I submit them, I push them to a, a test repo or um, you know, some repository that has testing facilities built in like GitHub or GitLab. Uh, and then when that's done, they will land in the tree either through some automation or you know, I have all the ticky boxes and so I do it myself. Um, there'll be a number of degrees of improvement along the way, but until we have um, you know, a, a bunch of CI tests that developers can run and a bunch of C, uh, a CI infrastructure that'll run those tests, in a stylized environment, um, you know, we won't be able to have a little ticky box that says merge this request um, as much as people might like that. Um, and by the way, the little ticky box phrase is TM John Baldwin. Next slide, please. So um, this is where I think Ed will take over. Um, if I remember right, Ed, this is where we we're going to yeah. end off. Yeah, I so think I'll so. Let Ed talk now. So this is um, uh, just a brief overview of what we um, what solutions we have uh, today, and uh, we we have some level of pre-commit build and test um, uh, in the tree, both relying on the the GitHub mirror. So um, we have a, a um, continuously updated uh, Git mirror on GitHub um, that that tracks uh, FreeBSD source of truth, uh, cgit.freebsd.org, um, git.freebsd.org, um, and uh, accepts pull requests. Um, Warner and I had a little discussion about um, it, it being good that we don't call it a read-only mirror um, because you know, it, it, is, um, it doesn't accept changes directly through GitHub's infrastructure, but um, we do bring changes in via pull requests um, on occasion. And there's a, a, a reasonably usable workflow to for developers to take changes that are in pull requests um, and, and bring them into the tree. Um, and these solutions um, uh, can run on, um, on pull requests uh, against the GitHub mirror as well. So the two, uh, two tools that we have integrated right now uh, are cross builds on macOS and Linux um, via GitHub Actions and Cirrus CI um, executing native FreeBSD builds. Um, and, and the Cirrus approach um, uses a FreeBSD VM running on uh, uh, Google, uh, Google Cloud and executes a boot smoke test um, uh, inside of QMU. So it builds a, a basic image and makes sure that the kernel at least boots and comes up um, to it gets to single user basically and just immediately shuts down and says everything's okay. Um, the GitHub cross builds are kernel only, um, uh, kernel only builds. Um, and uh, the, the Cirrus CI, um, I did most of the initial work to get that going in through BSD. Alex Richardson and Jess, I think, are the, the primary ones um, from Cambridge who did the GitHub Actions uh, work as part of their broader interest in. in Cross build uh, in general. Um, let's see here. Um, so there's a question right now, and, and Warner, I, I think we, we want to have this fairly interactive. So if there's um, questions, we should, I, I'm happy to take them sort of as we go through, and um, uh, you know, hop in with, with answers as well. If there's there's stuff here. Okay. The question the question is who's the target audience for the 
th this work? How hard is it to set up the pipeline for someone without a commit bit? Um, and so I'm, I'm going to uh, touch on that already. So that will be um, uh, uh, answered throughout uh, in just a moment. Um, but uh, I think it is that is a very very good question. And um, uh, the I, I would say I will I will say that the, the target audience is both FreeBSD developers who have the ability to push changes in um, and just sort of. Um, want to simplify their own workflow. That's that's kind of what drove my initial interest in getting Cirrus going. Um, you know, I um, uh, for for larger changes, um, I spent a you know the the kind of historical um, uh, use the historical workflow that previous developers have have often used um, of building in a whole new image and deploying it and testing it out and everything. Um, but for a lot of trivial, um, uh, relatively small changes. Um, you know, where I might have built them in a very hacky approach before. Um, I just have a, a work in progress branch that I push to um, uh, on GitHub and just rely on Cirrus um, uh, testing it for me. So, um, uh, oh. so Ed, there was another yep. question that's come up about um, that's probably relevant at this point. Uh, did you encounter what problems did you encounter with Linuxisms in the common CI CD pipelines? Yeah, and so that 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 is a um, uh, a good question. Um, uh, so the two that we have right now, Cirrus is probably um, I would say the only um, hosted CI as a service um, that is a, is very sort of OS agnostic. Um, it works really well with FreeBSD, Linux, Mac OS, and Windows. Um, and uh, I'll show the how, how we integrate with with Cirrus. Um, uh, and so, it, you know, it, there, there's basically no Linuxisms to deal with in in the kind of Cirrus CI workflow with FreeBSD. Um, uh, the um, uh, GitHub Actions cross build um, stuff is is it. It, it was added explicitly to test FreeBSD's cross build. Um, and so the Linux systems are, are a feature, not a bug in that case. Um, but yeah, certainly, um, uh, certainly that is a very um, Linux, you know, container centric view of the world. Um, and so we have, so we, we can go over the config files for both and kind of see that. Uh, yeah, Warner? I was going to add that um, since we can't run natively in um, GitHub, that because it is very Linux centric or to a lesser extent, kind of OS, um, sorry, Mac OS tolerant. Um, it, uh, we have some workarounds that allow us to do things, but we'll get into um, yeah. you know, what those workarounds are and what the implications are later in the talk as well. Um, and that's a, definitely a case where the Linux isms are uh, not so much isms, but centrism, you know, centric, uh, yeah. environments that make it uh, a little bit harder for us to just, you know, drop this thing in and have a, a solution that everybody else uses. And so mm -hmm. that's what been one of the problems that we've had in standing this up is that, you know, it's not, oh yeah, we'll write a half a dozen lines of YAML and everything will be fine. Um, you know, we have to, you know, drop down a couple of layers and get into runners and all of these other things. And then, how how much do you integrate that with the main system and so forth? So that's um, quite a bit larger problem than hey, I have a new um, open source thing. It runs on Linux. I'll just add the CI pipelines. Boom, I'm done. That you can get with GitHub integration today. Yeah. So um, my my slides here have a couple of screenshots from Cirrus's uh, website um, and. Uh, CirrusCI.org. Um, so it's a hosted CI service, um, which means they they run it. Um, it's a, a CI, CI AAS um, basically, um, and relies on all of the metadata for how to execute the um, the tests and the builds and the, the actual CI steps um, are contained in a file. Um, within the the repository itself, um, there is a bit of metadata you can. Uh, you can control externally. You can set environment variables and things for individual builds and such. But, but generally speaking, the actual um, information about what is a CI run uh, is contained within the um, uh, contained within the, the repository itself. Um, and 
uh, it really only works with GitHub um, uh, right now. There are some workarounds that are are more or less hacky to to integrate with others, um, but um, but really it's uh, it's intended to be used right now with with GitHub. It's the only one that it sort of properly works with out of the box. Um, with with that those one, caveats, it's uh, my experience with with, with Cirrus CI has been excellent. Yeah, Warner. I was going to say, Alan Summers has a question that I think is great to ask right now, which is, what advantages do, does GitHub Actions have over Cirrus, and why not test the cross build using uh, Cirrus too? Um, yeah, that's, that is a good question. Um, so, I don't know that there's um, a huge advantage to GitHub Actions. Um, you know, I mean, I suppose one possible. Um, uh, one possible um, benefit is being able to kind of shard the CI load across different services. Um, so Cirrus, Cirrus CI for open source projects provides um, uh, a, a certain amount of concurrent free um, uh, CI jobs. So uh, across there, they have a, a community cluster that um, basically services um, CI runs for all sort of free unpaid open source uh, projects. Um, and so if there's too much waiting, um, you know, your jobs might back up waiting for capacity on the community um, cluster. And you can only have so many of your own jobs running in the, the free service at the time. Um, and so, um, you know, we, we, right now, when we have a, a, a test build via GitHub, um, the, the, the Cirrus job and the GitHub uh, Actions jobs will all run at the same time on completely different, different services. Um, that said, Cirrus does support um, Mac OS and Windows and Linux um, builds, and we certainly could, um, we certainly could mirror some of the, um, uh, some of the build into, um, uh, into Cirrus, the, the, the things that we, we currently run on GitHub Actions. Um, so let me just, uh, yeah, so if I look, if we go back uh, one slide, I don't see will that work. Can I go back? Um, yeah, so you can see here, um, this, this is what you'll see, you know, on a, either a pull request or on a, um, an individual commit in your own repo, um, that all of this, the, the individual, um, uh, three uh, GitHub actions at the top and, and three um, Cirrus CI tasks uh, at the bottom. Um, they, they, re they report the same way. So from a you know, sort of user interface perspective, um, you know, all of the individual tests get reported or individual jobs get reported the, in the same interface. Um, and it doesn't really matter if it was uh, GitHub actions or, or Cirrus. I think one difference is that the GitHub Actions will only file a pull request or a push to like a, like the real main branch, which only happens on the mirrored pushes that come out of our main repo. Whereas Cirrus, if you have a work branch and you're doing changes on your work branch, Cirrus fires on those all the time. Okay. And, and the other, you get a little better um, when you have a complicated um, pipeline, you get a little bit better uh, reporting of that. Um, on GitHub and a, little, and a little bit better integration if you're doing it all with GitHub Actions rather than farming it out to runners or um, third parties like Sarah CI. It's not a huge advantage. Um, the advantage is bigger with GitLab because its uh, pipeline is a little bit nicer and you can have more fine-grained control. But mm -hmm. um, you know that is that is one of the reasons why we might want to use. Um, uh, you know, have something that gives us a little bit better uh, user experience, even yeah. though we get the same functionality with Zero CI. Well, what, one of the other um, one of the other potential benefits uh, may may as well be that for FreeBSD downstream consumers, you know, people who are building products on on FreeBSD, um, if they want to use hosted CI services um, and they already have uh, experience with. Uh, Cirrus CI say, or already have experience with GitHub Actions, um, you know, they may well want to continue using the same uh, environment. And, and um, so it's, it's useful for us, at least, um, as the upstream to have examples um, in both uh, in both schemes. Um, this is just a very brief uh, com uh, uh, comparison from, uh, you know, potentially biased, it's from Cirrus's own website, but uh, the, you know, the um, 
uh, the thing that's very compelling for us is that Cirrus CI is the only uh, hosted um, uh, CI service that that advertises and has good good uh, good quality um, you know tier one free BSD support. Yeah, Brooke, uh, Brooks Davis also added in the Zoom chat that I'm I'm saying for the people on YouTube that um, the resources are fairly limited on Cirrus CI because it's not a isn't owned by a top ten cloud provider. Um, compared to what you can get from uh, GitHub Actions, so we'll be we'll have a slower turnaround time potentially when if we use Cirrus CI, particularly as we make heavier and heavier use of it um, in the future. I mean, um, my experience has been that uh, I very rarely run into concurrency limits um, with with Cirrus. Um, uh, and I'll show an example of, of one of the jobs in in, in a, uh, a moment. But in any case, certainly it's you know there's value in us having having both. Um, yeah, so I agree. Th this is this is basically uh, just shows how Cirrus integrates with um, uh, with our repository. So uh, as a as an individual user, if you have a FreeBSD source um, fork on GitHub. Um, you, you would add Cirrus as an application and give it access to your repository to, to be able to see your commits. And so what happens is um, a, a commit gets pushed to GitHub either in your own repository as uh, or as a pull request. Um, Cirrus CI gets notified of that new change. It picks up the .cirrus.yaml file um, out of your repository, which tells it what jobs to, to run, um, whether it's going to be in VMs for, as for FreeBSD or, or containers or Mac OS uh, uh, VMs. Um, and then it runs the, the actual tests that are, are defined there and um, then sends those results back and they're reported in the, um, uh, in the uh, GitHub UI for that, that commit. Um, okay, so yeah, just the, the places that it, it can run. Um, so it, it does run on the main FreeBSD repository. Um, uh, so it picks up, um, picks up commits there. Um, individual developers uh, can add it uh, as an application to their own, their own fork. It runs on pull requests. Um, and Cirrus also has support for, um, for scheduled tasks, which is something we might want to, to look at for um, the plethora of different types of build configurations we, we, um, uh, we want to support. Um, and so if you look at the .cirrus.yaml file um, in the tree, um, this is on main um, here. And basically, uh, I'm just going to point out a couple of um, salient points in in here. Um, there's, uh, you know, if you if you want to see the full details, have a look at the file and the history and whatnot. Um, but this defines basically how our tests um, are going to be executed, what what sort of environment they're executed in. And in this case, um, it's a Google uh, um, Google Compute Engine um, uh, VM. And we are asking for a FreeBSD 13.1 image um, with eight CPUs and eight gigs of memory. Um, eight, eight CPUs is the maximum that um, we're able to, to request in this, um, this configuration. Uh, and then these are the three tasks that are defined. Um, the, uh, the first one is the uh, x86 uh, build and boot smoke test. Um, and then there's two that are uh, triggered manually um, that don't execute automatically. Um, there's a ARM64 build and a cross build using the, or a, um, a GCC build using the, um, uh, the, tool chain, uh, the GCC toolchain package. All, uh, all three of them actually rely on installing um, either LLVM or GCC from ports um, just to avoid the, uh, the extra time of, of building a compiler each, um, each time. Uh, and I mentioned, um, the cron or scheduled uh, tasks before. Um, this is something I'd, I'd like to like to try and do with like the ARM64 and GCC builds. Um, I don't think, I think there's a lot of value in being able to have a um, really quick smoke test um, just on, on every commit or on every pull request. Um, but uh, I think it's a waste of resources to, to run every single possible um, task against every single possible commit. Um, and then the actual, um, uh, the actual run itself um, basically uh, we have a, I have a script that uh, gives, it takes a list of packages um, and installs them. Um, and this is uh, D 
due to some flakiness in the, um, uh, the package uh, mirror itself. Um, uh, so it's a, you know, that's a workaround for, um, for our own infrastructural problems, I think, but um, uh, we don't want that to, to end up blowing up our uh, CI run. Um, then basically, um, uh, Cirrus by default, I think as, as do most of the, um, uh, the hosted services, um, they're running you. They're running in either your own ephemeral VM or container or whatever, and so they just do everything as root. And if you if you want to do um, anything uh, as a user, it's up to you to kind of um, uh, to take care of that yourself. And so uh, for us, I think it, you know it, it is very important that we are able to um, build as a user and operate against a read-only source repository. So. Um, but that's the, the bit of extra um, uh, mess in the setup script there. And then effectively, we just run um, uh, make build world, uh, build kernel packages, and then uh, tools boot CI commute test.sh is the script that actually um, installs the, the packages in a virtual disk image and runs them in QMU. Um, and so this is what the, the end result um, looks like. This is what you'll see for. Um, Every pull request or um, or commit uh, on the Cirrus side. So if you click on the little uh, icon that shows up in in the GitHub uh, results, it takes you to this page. And then um, you can click on the individual uh, individual tasks that are listed here, and it will show you the the, um, uh, the, the, the scripts that make up that task. Um, so if something fails, for example, you'll see. You know, the checkout or the clone was successful, and the package install was successful, and the build was successful, but the boot was boot failed or or whatnot. Um, and uh, yeah, that's 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 my quick overview of the um, uh, Cirrus uh, CI integration in FreeBSD. Um, I'll just cover the GitHub actions um, very briefly, um, and then um, I think we have some. Uh, Roadmap discussions and things, but that's probably a good uh, opportunity for more discussion and um, and such. Um, GitHub Actions works basically the same way. Um, uh, oh, so so as we mentioned earlier, um, GitHub Actions really is is focused on Linux containers and Mac OS VMs. Um, at least in the FreeBSD context, that's what we're using. Um, there is no direct FreeBSD support in, in GitHub Actions directly. Um, there is some work in progress and various hacks and workarounds to try and uh, to get there. Um, so I have three links here um, of, of ways to try and uh, integrate FreeBSD into GitHub Actions, and, and hopefully in the future um, that will be will be uh, something that we can support natively. But uh, but right now, um, I think for our, what we really care about, uh, the cross build support via that is is just fine. And so it's the same kind of approach. It's metadata um, within the uh, repository itself. And so it's mostly self-explanatory. On main and stable 13, um, uh, we're gonna we're gonna run um, as well as on pull requests on main. Uh, and then specify the the individual jobs. Um, and so instead of providing a VM as we did in the FreeBSD case on Cirrus, um, we're asking for uh, containers um, uh, on Ubuntu. Um, for example, here, and then same idea again. Um, the individual steps for um, setting up packages that are are um, prerequisites for whatever build we're going to run, and then the um, the actual uh, build and or test commands. In this case, um, you can see we're just running build kernel, uh, doing uh, Linux uh, build kernels. Uh, so I, that that's the. What I had for the kind of overview of, of things. Um, let's see what's on the, uh, the Q and A here. Yeah, we have a few questions here before um, we sh should get into the roadmap talk. Um, DCH is asking about uh, Cirrus allowing uh, BYO agents and having an ARM sixty four um, runner. Um, you know, because Ampere has expressed interest in further hardware contributions, is that a possibility? Yeah, so I mean, I think this that is that is certainly um, uh, um, certainly a, something that that's you know very much a possibility. We can um, uh, right now we're sort of um, uh, 
uh, reliant on um, uh, the fact that Cirrus, uh, Cirrus is very generous in, in providing um, the VM resources and such that they do. Um, but uh, yeah, I think, you know, I, I think we can, we can absolutely um, provide our own hardware, provide a Cirrus uh, runner or agent on there and connect it into um, uh, having Cirrus um, execute that. Um, I think that's, that's a good roadmap um, discussion and um, uh, something I think that we, uh, in the same way that I think it, you know, for an upstream operating system, there's a lot of value in us supporting different approaches. Um, you know, I think I think that is something that would be valuable for us to support, even if we also um, provide our, our own um, uh, entire, you know, our, our own sort of end to end um, uh, CI and integration workflow um, that doesn't rely on external services. Um, I see Alan says, are there limits to how many serious builds we get per time period um, is buying more a reasonable option. So Cirrus does have um, uh, paid plans as well. Um, uh, I, so I, I think the, um, I think we are constrained by, um, uh, you know, potential uh, concurrency limits on their open source resources. Um, but uh, uh, I don't think we have a, like, you know, we've run out of our time for the month and, and therefore we're to get no more builds. Um, uh, you know, we, um, uh, that's, that hasn't happened on uh, FreeBSD uh, main um, uh, to date uh, and, you know, hasn't happened on my own individual builds um, as well. Um, I think it's, I think Cirrus is, um, uh, Sirius has a plan at like ten dollars a month or something that um, that gets you double the amount of uh, of concurrency and, and that's something that's sort of you know would be um, a relatively small cost and, and reasonable to um, uh, for us to to do. Um, but also, I you know as as Dave was asking about earlier, I think if we provide our own um, uh, our own runners, um, our own agents, then it also uh, would reduce the um, the cost and increase the amount of uh, concurrent things we can. We can do. And uh, do any of the hosted CI pipelines support nested virtualization? Um, so conceivably, uh, uh, we could do this um, with Cirrus. Uh, I am. Um, it, it may require a very small feature um, enhancement on their side. It might not. I'm, I'm not 100 percent sure. Um, but basically, uh, you know. It, Basically, Cirrus is um, spinning up a uh, GCP um, uh, VM on our behalf to run our test. Um, and so as long as um, GCP will provide us a VM that's, that has nested virtualization enabled and uh, we, we can make use of it on, on the client side, um, then there's no kind of fundamental reason that that wouldn't work. Um, I, I looked into this um, quite some time ago and I can't recall, I think like the GCP had a, um, uh, a limitation on that, that I think maybe they will only um, claim to support or will only let you run Linux guests, uh, do nested virtualization with Linux guests. Um, but uh, I mean, the, there, may, there may be some hurdles to get there. But fundamentally, I think it is something that is um, is feasible. Uh, let's see here is. I'm curious if Warner is um, uh, has dropped off. Looks like it's possible. It would seem that that might have happened. Yeah. Presumably, he will come back. Um, we had a question earlier on. Um, that you might want to speak explicitly to, which was, um, so far your talk has been very source focused, but do you also have thoughts about um, CI and ports and doc? Yeah, so, um, I mean, 
we had a little discussion about this on, on IRC and Doc um, does have Cirrus um, integrated uh, already and, and gives you a little green check mark, um, at least that it builds. Um, my question was, uh, you know, in, in, um, in source, we're, we're doing this little boot smoke test. Um, that's a very, um, uh, very limited kind of uh, level of testing, but is, uh, I mean, on the one hand, it's a fairly limited test. On the other hand, uh, you know, it, 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 it's very good at catching kind of gross errors um, if, uh, if your kernel, kernel will speak food. Um, uh, it's a little bit un less clear what it means for a doc tree to, to pass its tests. Um, um, but I mean, certainly at least verifying that, um, you know, it's, it, it's able to render properly and everything uh, and give you uh, um, the, the, the doc build is successful is, is something um, that makes a lot of sense. And, and this exact same approach in source works, works well in docs. Um, in ports, I think, you know, there's no reason we couldn't fundamentally do the same thing. Um, uh, uh, ports to some extent, um, so, sources is, is in some ways, as Warner mentioned, a very challenging um, uh, case for CI and testing um, because we're building a whole new OS and um, need to either run it in, in a VM or in, on bare metal somehow and need to have, figure out how to get it there. Um, in, um, in ports, as long as we're, you know, if, if our, uh, our ports, uh, if the target is a FreeBSD release or a FreeBSD snapshot that already has an image existing in, in GCP, um, then Cirrus will happily um, get us a VM of that um, and can build the, you know, the specific port um, and, uh, and do whatever sort of testing is, uh, is, is that exists um, in the ports tree or for that specific port already. Um, the, I think that probably the biggest challenge um, uh, for that is just the, um, uh, the kind of scale of um, uh, how, you know, just how much CPU time is needed um, to do it, uh, to build arbitrarily large number of ports. Um, and there's no, uh, there's no easy built-in sort of way to cache objects between, uh, between runs, right? So if um, the, the, the sort of naive approach, you know, you can very easily just add it on serious.yml to the ports tree and have it um, uh, just you know, go into a specific um, uh, port and, and, and do a build. But um, yeah, I think there's, if we had infinite resources at, at zero cost, um, you know, you could you could write a um, you could write a serious serious that just uh, goes to the top of the port tree and does make and just you know tries to build everything in that uh, that way. Um, uh, so clearly, that's not really feasible, especially with um, with the resources that are, are available to us. Um, and so, uh, I think that's something that re would require. Um, a fair bit more work for us to, to have a compelling and, and useful story there. Uh, let's see here. Do we have any other um, other questions on the go? Let's see if I get. Okay. Um, oh, here's one again. There were. Uh, there were hey, some. I'm having. No yeah, I'm having network problems. So there were some comments. Alan Summers had noted um, over here in the Zoom chat that Cirrus does have an open ticket to add native ARM64 support for FreeBSD. Um, I guess they they already provide Linux on ARM64, which rather than using GCP, uses AWS instances. 
Mm-hmm. So maybe that will land someday. In which case, that'll be much easier to just use to do ARM64 testing with Sirius. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, um, for the, um, for, I, I think it would be useful to have some incidental testing via that route. Um, but for, um, for what we're actually executing in Cirrus. Um, so we have an ARM64 test job in, in, um, uh, in Cirrus.yaml today, right? And it just, it builds, it cross builds from x86 and then runs uh, in QMU, um, uh, runs the ARM64 image in QMU and does the boot smoke test. Um, and so fundamentally, because, because we're not using uh, any sort of acceleration with QMU on, on x86, it basically is performing the, the same task. Um, uh, and so the, the actual image that we're testing, we get the same sort of coverage regardless of the fact that it's an x86 host. Um, other than, you know, we, we don't get any incidental um, uh, coverage in that, you know, we, we, we sort of, um, we, we get a bunch of incidental testing by virtue of Cirrus CI spinning up lots of FreeBSD uh, x86 13.1 VMs to, to do various um, uh, test runs. I oh, gotcha. Um, and Warner just noted, apparently his his ISP had a bad day today. Um, so he's trying to, five, and 5G doesn't work quite well enough. So um, we can see your text, Warner. I'll try to relay for you. Did you, so I don't know, what, I feel like we haven't yet talked about future plans and roadmap. Is that something? Yeah, and so there, there's, there's, there's some... we've got, we're, we're actually close to the end of your slot, but I'll let, let it, we can run a little over into the, the break. But let's, yeah, I'd like to hear what, you, what your plans are for that. Yeah, okay. Um, and so um, part, part of that is sort of, um, uh, we don't have a, you know, a very concrete set of, of steps. We have some, some broad ideas and uh, our goal is to, to kind of, um, uh, you know, perhaps with some support from the new core team, um, reinvigorate the, um, uh, the, the CI um, and, and workflow uh, the, even beyond CI, like the, the, the workflow um, working group. Um, but anyway, uh, before I get onto that, I'll just quickly go over these. Um, so this is just two other, um, um, two other uh, CI uh, approaches or services that could easily support what we, um, the same sorts of things that, that we've talked about with Sirius and, and GitHub Actions. Um, and then we also have um, two uh, uh, links to the wiki here. Um, this is generally speaking using um, Cirrus CI or other um, uh, other approaches um, to uh, to run testing on free of, of third party software on FreeBSD. Um, and so there's there's quite a lot of um, of GitHub repos with Cirrus YAML files in them that that run their test suites um, on FreeBSD. Uh, and so I think that's something we definitely want to um, encourage and, and support. It's a little bit orthogonal to, um, you know, the, the goal of testing FreeBSD, FreeBSD itself, but I think it is something that overall is is really important for us as a, a project to, to make sure that um, uh, third-party software continues to build on FreeBSD and get tested. Um, So uh, Warner, I think, was going to speak to these. Uh, let me see if uh, if he happens to have enough bandwidth at the moment. Maybe not. Oh. So uh, I, I'll talk a little bit about one of the items on here. Um, second one on the on the list. Um, uh, and that is that right now our approaches to um, um, uh, Cirrus, is, uh, Cirrus specifically or, or GitHub Actions is it's a very binary view of what tests need to run, um, you know, for any given pull request or or push to a, a, a repo, um, and uh, the Cirrus. Um, you know, we have manual control over the, the GCC or ARM64 builds, but basically it's, you know, it's either, um, you either get a, a test or you don't. And, and um, 
for smaller projects, that probably makes a lot of sense. It's, 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 or it's just fine, right? Um, if your entire test suite takes a minute or two to run, um, then there's no reason you really need to care about subsetting it. Um, it, again, if we if we had sort of infinite resources um, and infinite budget, um, you know, we, we could conceivably um, either run uh, with what we have today. We could extend the smoke test um, and actually just have it create a disk image and run the entire um, uh, test suite that exists in the tree um, in, in the in the base system inside of uh, QMU. I mean, it would take an incredibly long time, but um, you know, conceivably, it's uh, it's possible and would give us um, uh, give us all of the results. Um, and I think, you know, even even if we solved the the problem that um, QMU is slow, say we had nested virtualization uh, and we could run in Beehive, uh, and um, and you know there, there wasn't a performance issue there. Um, there's still the issue that our full test suite takes a long time to uh, to execute and. You know, you don't want to pay that cost. You, you don't want to um, pay that cost if someone pushes a change to fix a man page typo or such. And so, you know, we need to, to have some way of figuring out what sets of changes are appropriate to, what sets of tests are appropriate to run on any given change. Um, yeah, we, then, we need like a meta mode for testing. So when the test is built, only those tests that um, actually changed would then get run. And we don't have anything like that um, today. And we don't have good build optimization even. I mean, those those are individual problems that we can uh, yeah. potentially uh, tackle once we have something that's in place. Something that's suboptimal that we can optimize is better than fretting over, um, you know, how do we get all of this taken care of and perfect before we go live? So. By the way, I'm back, Ed. <laughs> Thanks, Warner. Yes. Um, do you want to go over the, the other other points on your uh, Warner? Um. So uh, I, I'm not sure how much of this you've you've covered. Um, I, I've talked about the second one basically here. Okay. Um. Yeah, one of the things that would be nice uh, for developers we would get benefit from is if I could type make CI or make test, and have it actually run the CI tests. And if it passes locally, it'll pass when I push to the main repository. Or if I push the main repository and it fails, I can run it locally and use that for more fine-grained debugging. Um, there are efforts underway to get this work funded, um, but uh, nothing has been finalized yet. Um, and then um, the other thing is, uh, um, one of the things that would be uh, useful for us to provide is um, some additional um, examples and configuration so that uh, both downstreams uh, can leverage the CI that we have, uh, as well as um, any project that wants to support FreeBSD, we have kind of some off the shelf recipes that we can use depending on what CI system they have to integrate into their system. Uh, we have some of that today. Um, Lee Wynn um, has a, a page uh, uh, with that that was unfortunately in a prior meeting and I didn't save a link to it. Um, <clears throat> or I would, you know, share it on IRC now. Uh, if Lee Wynn is listening in, he can share maybe on Dev Summit. Um, so, um, so there, there are those things. And um, in order to keep the ball moving, we want to have our next update be at the Developer Summit um, in uh, Vienna at EuroBSDCon. Um, so that's kind of where we're targeting towards having uh, you know future uh, communication. Um, if you, uh, I know that Lee Wynn is also he's asked me to run some meetings. I'm not sure how public they will be, but in this area so that we can um, get things, uh, you know, get, get at least some of the testing aspects of this uh, rolling um, as well. Um, I see a question from Alan uh, in the Q&A here. Um, it's uh, asking whether we have 
a solution for providing runners or agents or whatever for third party projects um, that have their own CI uh, uh, CI infrastructure. Um, so for example, um, uh, the Python has their own CI and um, uh, Kubes provides a, um, a VM or, or a physical machine, I'm not sure, but provides a, a runner that connects to it um, and executes the tests. Um, and uh, other some other projects, LLVM being brought up as, as a prime example of one of these that, that needs this. Um, and I think, you know, the, the answer I think is that we have um, uh, ad hoc individual instances of this, you know, often run by individual uh, uh, members of the Fibiusta community or such. Um, we don't have a overall, I think, project level view um, of this. The, the, um, uh, the hosted CI um, or third party CI links that I, I shared um, uh, in the, earlier in the previous slide, um, you know, uh, we at least sort of have enumerated um, uh, some of the ones that exist and, and have an idea of what ones we want to support. But um, I don't think we have a consistent way to, to ensure that the projects we care about um, uh, have this. And Ellen brings up LLVM and uh, um, that's, all, that's on my plate to make sure that we get one set up. Um, so I told them we would, uh, I would, would take care of that and, and haven't managed to do it yet. Um, but, uh, you know, they, they, for an OS to be listed as officially supported, um, this is for libc++ specifically, um, we need to provide a CI runner um, uh, for it. And so I think at the very, very least, we need to make sure that we know which those projects are um, that, that require that and figure out how to make it happen. Um, but um, how we make this sustainable, I think, is, a, is an open question. Um, so are we um, at the end of our, our time? Do we have any more discussion? Uh, we can carry on in the hallway track if we are. Um, I think we're, we're a little bit over, aren't we? Yeah, about. Yeah, actually, we probably should move to the hallway track. Um, we're, we have about 20 minutes left till the next presentation at this point. OK, thank you. Okay, well, thank you, Ed and Warner. I would encourage folks to go over to the hallway track. We can talk about this or previous topics. And we'll be back in about 20 minutes or so. So we'll see you then.
<clears throat> okay, welcome back, folks, um, from our break. Um, today, for our next session, we're going to have a. Oh, I skipped back a slide. Oh, how about this? <laughs> we'll just do that. That's a simple solution. All right. So, um, our next. Oh, stop. Be quiet, PowerPoint. Um, our next talk is going, or is going to be a panel discussion on security, and it's going to be hosted by um, Ed Mass, Mark Johnston, and Marius Saborski. So I will turn it over to you three. All right. Thanks, John. Um, so again, this I'm hoping is going to be um, a somewhat interactive um, uh, discussion, but um, we have have some slides to to present a few um, uh, a few uh, specific points that uh, we've prepared. Um, so there's four kind of main um, main topics for this this session. Um, a little bit about uh, Sec Team and, and some of the changes that have happened to it um, over time, and and other changes that might uh, might um, come down uh, for for Sec Team moving forward. Um, uh, how issues are found and reported and and dealt with. Um, vulnerability mitigations that have been added to FreeBSD over the last uh, last while, and some proactive approaches to improving security. Um, so here's a, um, a screen grab from the uh, website on what the security team is. Um, and uh, this, um, you know, is, is sort of a, um, uh, a high level statement, but doesn't really get into kind of the the, the details of what um, uh, what it actually means. Um, Sec team is responsible for uh, for security of FreeBSD overall. Um, although Ports um, has its own uh, own specific team that handles um, vulnerability issues in individual ports and the ports collection, um, separate from. Uh, uh, sec team, and I think this is something that you know. Moving forward, um, we should try to make sure we have good coordination and collaboration, um, at least. But um, but it, it makes sense that uh, the ports uh, the ports team um, you know has a slightly different set of um, of issues and and upstream to uh, issues dealing with upstreams and such. So it's 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 fundamentally going to be a slightly different case. Um, and then this is from the reporting a security issue uh, website or web page. Um, distinct makes a little distinction between what um, uh, the security officer um, uh, alias is and the security team. Uh, and I think this is something that in the past um, had a maybe a slightly larger distinction um, in that that uh, SO was a very um, Either a single person or a very small um, group, and Sec Team was very large. Um, at this point, uh, Sec Team and SO are uh, they're both um, greater than one and less than ten uh, sort of um, uh, sort of cases. But um, one of the things that's happened to, to Sec Team um, over time, uh, and, you know, with, with Gordon as the current um, uh, secu uh, head security officer, um, one of the things we've done is incorporate or brought um, uh, the responsibility for fixes and um, uh, dealing with issues uh, to the individual developer community. Uh, in the past, you know, a, um, a, a security issue would be um, would be reported and sec team would deal with it and a commit would show up and, and that might be the first um, uh, someone would um, a developer who is knowledgeable about that area might be the first time they're they're aware of it um, or you know might on a, on an individual basis um, they might be brought in to, to work on things but you know it wasn't it wasn't kind of the um, the natural fundamental way that the team operates um, so one of the things Gordon's done is, is made it so that um, uh, Every FreeBSD developer has an account um, on the, um, the bug tracker that that um, where security uh, related bugs um, are are dealt with. Uh, it can be CC'd on on bugs that have um, that are in their their area of expertise. And I think there's a, there's a few reasons um, uh, this makes sense. Um, you know, 
the, the nature of um, uh, the nature of, of bugs and vulnerabilities um, is, is different than when when this this team you know started years and years and years ago, um, and and there's uh, a lot like there's a lot of domain specific knowledge that's really necessary to to have effective um, uh, responses to um, uh, to issues. Um, so the first line on this is it, the, the sec team to to PCER, uh, um uh, you know, product security incident response team. Um, I think that's kind of just highlighting um, a uh, transition that's been underway for, for quite some time. Um, uh, the responsibility for reviewing security related aspects of various um, code areas or uh, you know, architectural kind of uh, questions um, that used to fall entirely to, to SEC team, but um, uh, I think that's um, sec team doesn't necessarily have the the um, the background in, in all of the um, in the specific functional areas, um, and so the the CSPRNG review team is is sort of the first example of um, of that happening. Um, so there's you know a, a team of people uh, who are responsible for um, reviewing changes to um, the the random. Uh, and a number uh, infrastructure, um, and that's so. It, instead of sort of it being sec team's responsibility wholly for um, reviewing those sorts of things, the, the it's the, res the responsibility for that is delegated to um, uh, individuals who are knowledgeable and aware of the um, specific um, specific functional area. Um, that's basically the the very brief overview I have of of um, those sort of functional changes. Um, I'm curious if there's any questions or um, uh, or comments um, before we'll get on to uh, the next section, which is um, Mark talking about some um, aspects of uh, discovering um, uh, issues internally with our within our own community. I'm just checking on IRC or uh, on the Zoom Q and A. Um, I don't see any uh, any questions. Uh, here at the moment. So with that, I will um, uh, let Mark uh, take on, take over. Sure, can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, um, so, I mean, obviously, you know, finding security vulnerabilities is a bit of an art, um, but for the past few years, we've been automating um, that to, to a fairly large extent. Um, and by that, I'm, I'm talking about Syscaller, which is something I've, I've talked about at past dev summits um, multiple times, so I won't go into it in very much detail. Um, but in short, it's it's uh, a coverage-guided fuzzer for the kernel. It generates programs uh, consisting of chains of system calls and really has the you know one goal, which is to crash the kernel. Um, it's very effective at doing that. It was originally developed for Linux, um, but it's been uh, extended to to fuzz all of the BSDs and quite a few other operating systems besides. Um, and uh, Google uh, very generously runs a, a public instance called Sysbot, um, uh, from which this uh, screenshot was taken. Uh, so what it what it does twenty four seven is, uh, you know, fuzzes uh, the latest FreeBSD kernel, uh, which gets rebuilt every twenty four hours or so. Um, multiple instances are running in uh, Google's. Uh, in, in GCE, and uh, yeah, the, the fuzzer is running continuously. Syscaller detects crashes when they happen, basically by monitoring the serial console and generates reports, which uh, get sent to a, a mailing list, and then developers look at those reports and try to fix the bug. Uh, so if you visit uh, the Sysbot uh, FreeBSD webpage, you'll see there's several hundred bugs that have been fixed or are marked invalid for one reason or another. Um, and if, if you look at commit logs, you'll probably have seen quite a few references to Syscaller. Uh, so it's a very good bug finding tool. And because it tends to exercise rarely executed portions of the kernel, um, it's very good at finding security vulnerabilities as well. And we've had uh, a number of CVEs in the past few years that were uh, found by uh, found by Syscaller. Um, it's, it's really quite good at, at kind of exposing all the kind of gremlins that are hiding within the kernel. Um, you know, our system call interface is pretty big. Individual system calls are simple, but when you chain them together, you can create some pretty bizarre interactions um, that won't be, that that'll never occur. Uh, 
you know, when, when you're running actual programs that people will use. Um, but of course, those are the kinds of interactions that security, uh, you know, f folks trying to find vulnerabilities for, for good or for evil um, will look for. So uh, Syscaller really does a good job fleshing them out. Um, and uh, so, and I mean, you know, having been on SAG team for the past couple of years, um, I can see that quite a few bug reports that come to us from various security researchers uh, were, were found by Syscaller. Even if they don't say it, it's usually possible to tell um, just by looking at the uh, the sample code that's provided. Um, and uh, if you go to the next slide, I'll, I'll give a hint for uh, what I'm talking about there. So one of the really cool features of Syscaller is that when it finds a crash, it tries quite hard and often successfully to find a reproducer for it, which is a standalone C program that you can take and compile and run in your own system and reproduce the same crash. Um, so they tend to, I mean, they're, they're automatically generated programs. You can't really read them very easily, um, but they, Syscaller is very, very effective at uh, generating them. So yeah, when I, when I see a, um, uh, a notification of a bug or a security bug from a, from a researcher and the reproducer looks something like that, um, you know, that's, that's usually a pretty good sign that they found it uh, with Syscaller. And that's again, happening pretty, pretty often these days. So uh, it's quite important for us to, you know, try to stay ahead of that. Um, uh, I and, and a number of other FreeDC developers have been doing quite a bit of work uh, Fixing syscaller reports, you know, the, there's one instance in public sysbot, but uh, a number of us run uh, private syscaller instances. Um, we, we, you know, at times extend syscaller to test different parts of FreeBSD, um, and, and usually you find a new new bugs. Um, when we do fix bugs, you know, some code auditing is usually in order. Bugs tend to cluster, so when you fix or when you find one bug and fix it, usually you'll find several related ones nearby. So it's always worth uh, spending time doing that, uh, and those those reproducers tend to tend to result in uh, reduceful regression tests as well. So there's a collection. There's there's several collections of them out um, in the world, and and uh, uh, folks who test FreeBSD often or will will sometimes run those uh, reproducers to see if they turn up anything new. And uh, the other, uh, uh, one more slide, please. The other thing I wanted to talk about, or, or perhaps advancement in FreeBSD in the past couple of years, uh, has been the introduction of uh, kernel sanitizers. Um, I shouldn't say introduction. There's been uh, an implementation of the undefined behavior sanitizer, and I think the concurrency sanitizer. Um, but last year, I spent some time uh, porting the kernel address sanitizer and kernel memory sanitizer from NetBSD. Um, and those are uh, very effective at finding um, Things like buffer overflows used after freeze, the sorts of bugs that can can very often be turned into um, uh, uh, a security exploit. So uh, they combined with Syscaller, uh, you know, just just help us find more bugs more easily with with more reliable reproducers. Um, so you know, I think continuing to invest in these in these kinds of technologies has been very important for FreeBSD, and it's something that Sec Team um, you know, actively spends time on. Um, at least I certainly do, uh, and so I think we're in, in a you know pretty good place right now, just based on public reports available. Um, but there's there's a ton of extra, you know, a, a, a lot of directions we can go. Um, there's lots of portions of FreeBSD that don't really get fuzzed today, um, and uh, yeah, I, I think uh, it's 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 an area where we're going to see um, a lot of a lot of uh, advancement over the next few years. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that that was it for, for Syscaller. That's the, that's the main thrust of the proactive bug finding that, that I do on a regular basis. Um, code auditing is another important part of it, um, which I mentioned already. Um, and also just paying attention to bug reports. Um, a lot of folks will, you know, uh, hit, a, hit a crash. They don't know necessarily that it's, a, you know, security relevant in some way. It's just a kernel panic, you know, and so they'll report it and upon some examination, You'll find, oh, hey, uh, an unprivileged user can actually use this to to um, to obtain privileged access to the system. So it, it becomes uh, a security advisory, um, and this this is something that also happens pretty regularly. Um, you know, we've we've had bugs found by uh, Peter Holmes' stress two test or test suite that turned into uh, CVEs, um, bug reports on you know in our in our bugzilla. Um, so uh, just just I think a big part of SecTeam's role is to, is to monitor those kinds of channels and you know make sure that bug reports 
you know, do, do get addressed in a timely manner. Mm -hmm. And I think that was all I wanted to say there. Yeah. Um, if we, depending on how much time we, we have here, we can maybe do a live um, look at Sysbot uh, um, at the, the end of it if, if we have a little bit more time. But um, I think I did want to just touch on one thing you mentioned, um, which is sort of areas for future um, uh, development with, with respect to, to Syscaller and more FreeBSD coverage. I think one of the things um, that is uh, is a, would be a very valuable um, path forward, and this is already done in um, in Syscaller for other um, other operating systems. Um, is being able to uh, Syscaller has the ability with with some uh, additional work to, um, on the the you know the client or guest side um, to to do things like um, uh, inject uh, Wi-Fi uh, frames or uh, you know provide a us a virtual usb um device and it can it can fuzz the um the communication um protocol running over those interfaces um and i think that's something that would be very valuable for us to um uh, to explore as well yeah for sure um yeah there, there's there's linux is quite a bit more um advanced in that regard in, in terms of its use of syscaller and uh, so i mean you know, in FreeBSD, we, we mostly fuzz the system call interface and Syscaller knows how to use, um, I think it's like the, the tap interface to inject packets into the network stack. Um, but yeah, for Wi-Fi, we need, we need uh, um, a bit more glue and we don't currently have that. Yeah, USB is the same story. Um, I had a GSOC project last year um, to add support for fuzzing the, the Linux relator, so the, the implementation of Linux system calls. So that's actually functional, it's just not integrated yet. Um, and so, I mean, yeah, there, there's quite a few different paths, you know, you can go down. There was an interesting uh, tweet by Dmitry Vyukov who, who, you know, wrote Syscaller originally. Um, and he was talking about, a, you know, an interesting project idea would be to take, you know, all of the CVEs that have been assigned to, you know, FreeBSD, all, or at least the FreeBSD kernel, and sort of make Syscaller smart enough to go back and find those vulnerabilities if they, if they still existed today. Um, just based on the observation, again, that bugs tend to occur in clusters. So, um, you know, uh, if, if there was a vulnerability in the past that was found by say code inspection and was fixed, um, if we trained somehow, if we trained Syscaller to, to find that same bug, there's a good chance it'll find uh, uh, related things. And um, yeah, I, I, can, I can absolutely think of examples of that just off the top of my head. Uh, so that like, you know, there, there's, there's quite a few different avenues to, to go down if, if this is something uh, anyone's interested in pursuing. Yeah, I think there's there's definitely an opportunity for others to um, to collaborate on uh, on this as well. I mean, there's a lot of uh, a lot of work to do, and and you know, I mean, I think over time um, things will continue to get added, but um, but certainly there's there's opportunity for for collaboration and, and more people working in parallel on on various aspects here. Uh, mm -hmm. I think I think Dimitri um, Dimitri's comment is um, you know is, is sort of a very critical thing for us to think about. Um, you know, basically, yeah, using the examples of, of vulnerabilities that have actually occurred in the past um, to, to, to ask ourselves, how can we make sure that we would identify, or how, how can we identify this type of, this class of vulnerability or this, this you know, type of issue, um, uh, wherever it may appear in, in the tree. Um, there is a question uh, from IRC, um, uh, Basically, about the the workload of triaging the um, the, re the, re the reports from uh, Sysbot, like how much effort is it, um, and does the bot do any classification or prioritization of the reports? Um, there's no prioritization per se. Um, as far as classification goes, um, reports are you know uh, they're grouped together by panic message effectively. So. You know, any bug which results in a particular panic message, um, uh, you know, gets a unique report. And there's there's some kind of mangling that happens to make sure that, like, you know, Fatal Trap 12 doesn't, you know, you, you don't kind of merge unrelated bugs with the same panic message into one. Um, so, you know, as far as triage goes, it's it's mostly manual. I, I There's, like I said, there's a mail list that receives mail anytime a new report is found. Um, and another email when a reproducer is found. So a number of us monitor it. Uh, um, certain bugs, you know, bugs with reproducers do tend to get fixed fairly quickly. Um, 
there's a few subsystems that are a bit problematic in that regard, but most of the core kernel, or I, I would say all of the core kernel is, is you know, treated uh, quite promptly. Um, so it, it's, it's largely manual. And unfortunately, like it, it's, you, you have to have some, you know, in order to contribute to it, you have to have some, some comfort with kernel development, right? Because more often than not, when you look at a report, it's going to be in some random subsystem of the kernel that you totally, you know, aren't familiar with. You've got this reproducer, but it just kind of calls a bunch of system calls and, and who knows what they're actually supposed to do. So you, you do tend to spend a lot of time just, you know, building a mental model of how things should work uh, before you actually can, can fix the bug. Um, but certainly, you know, things that aren't addressed in a timely manner, you know, and any, any kind of like, effort to to highlight bugs that aren't getting fixed quickly would be would be useful um, I don't think the burden of these reports is is overly large I know there's been some commentary in the Linux community that like you know especially with sanitizers enabled they get so many sysbot reports that it's actually pretty difficult to, to stay on top of everything and figure out what's fixed and what's not you know there's there's quite a few different branches to track um, in FreeBSD, it's it's not as overwhelming I think um, Partly because we have some some people dedicated to working on this kind of stuff, and partly just because you know we 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 don't have as much um, uh, uh, surface. All right, uh, I don't see any other questions. Um, yeah, there is one more on Zoom, oh, I believe. Okay. Uh, about uh, which subsystems right now uh, we should target or you know focus on uh, in case of fuzzing. Um, so, I mean, uh, so USB and Wi-Fi were already mentioned, and those were those those are two that would definitely benefit. Um, they they aren't quite trivial in that, like they they require some device emulation uh, glue in order for for Sysbot to to sort of reach into them effectively. Um, ZFS is another one. Right now, all of the images that Syscaller fuzzes are are UFS based. Um, but I think in the near future we'll, we'll have it'll be much easier to build, um, you know, ZFS-based VM images for for use in fuzzing. So I I, I anticipate that that's going to be resolved in the next couple of months. Um, I think drivers in general are are under tested, um, especially uh, I don't know what our terminology is like virtual interface or virtual network drivers. So things like lag, VLAN. Um, uh, you know, wire guard, uh, any, any kind of, or neck graph, any, any of those sort of middle layers um, in the kernel right now, um, they, they don't get fuzzed particularly well. And that's mostly a question of, you know, putting, putting some time in to teach syscaller to, to create such interfaces. So, I mean, with PF, for instance, um, I think it was Christoph, he added uh, a number of descriptions of all the, the PF IO controls, which are, you know, the main interface for configuring PF. And so now most of the PF control interface is fuzzed and that's actually found a number of bugs. It's hard to say whether, you know, they're, they're really all that consequential, um, but uh, uh, certainly it, it provides, you know, useful regression testing if nothing else. Um, so syscaller is coverage guided. Um, you, can, you can kind of look at code coverage metrics to see if there's any subsystems that, that are missing. And, and again, there's certainly quite a few that I can think of off the top of my head. So, um, you know, which one to pick? Uh, it, I think that's that's kind of hard to say. Um, you know, there, there's a good chance any any time you add descriptions for a new interface, you're, you're most likely going to find find some bugs, whether they're you know um, important or not. It's it's hard to say, but you'll find something. Uh, okay. Um... A uh, question regarding security issues, which are seen in multiple BSD OSs due to code inheritance. Is this coordinated? Um, sometimes better, sometimes worse. Um, I think um, you know there there are there have been some some very good examples of um, uh, of issues that were reported or discovered by third parties um, that involved kind of. Um, uh, large scale uh, multi OS um, efforts, and you know we've um, we we have collaborated with OpenBSD and NetBSD folks on on some specific issues in the past. Um, also with um, 
uh, we've actually had some good collaboration even with, with folks like uh, from Citrix um, uh, on uh, some, you know, there was no code inheritance in that case, but just sort of technical details and, and sharing some, some discussion. Um, I think that um, the, the issues that we've, we've dealt with um, more recently um, are probably uh, um, uh, probably um, not ones that are um, uh, are common to other other BSDs. I think one of the um, um, you know I, I think a lot of a sort of uh, user land um, you know classic buffer overflows and, and things in in the base system. Um, those kinds of of things are you know largely been uh, a lot of that code to the extent that it's shared with other BSDs hasn't changed in, in years and years, right? So um, a lot of the kinds of vulnerabilities that would show up in, in those things have been dealt with long, long ago. Um, and so I think, you know, to the extent that we have either um, vulnerabilities in kernel subsystems, um, like the recent Wi-Fi issue that we had, um, none of those are, um, are shared with, um, with with uh, with OpenBSD or NetBSD, for example, um, we have um, uh, in the past um, dealt with like uh, uh, Dragonfly, for instance. Um, you know, has a much closer lineage with FreeBSD um, than OpenBSD or NetBSD will, and so we've we've uh, passed on details of, of issues um, uh, to we, we, or sh or we're collaborating with them. In the past, I think it is it is something that you know absolutely we are. It would be beneficial both to FreeBSD and to others to have kind of a, an ongoing collaboration on on these sorts of things, and we have some some communication channels to have those discussions. Um, but I think the the reality of the situation is just that you know recent issues haven't really been um, been things that um, are, are common to to other. Um, at least to OpenBSD and NetBSD. Let's see here. So I think that's all the questions from um, I have from IRC. We see any others on Zoom right now. So um, we'll have a quick um, quick slide here on vulnerability mitigations that have um, gone into the tree in the last um, last little while, uh, either are in progress or um, you know in. Um, uh, went into the tree in, in the last year, two years, three years, sorts of thing. Um, these are all links to the, um, the commits that made these changes. Um, and uh, I'm not gonna go through them one by one, but um, you, know, you can look at the slides later on and have a look at these. Um, the ASLR implementation or ASR implementation that's in, um, in Maine now is, is, and is merged to stable 13. Um, uh, the semi-half folks um, have prepared the, um, uh, MFC of enabling it by um, by default, uh, so it's not in 13.1, but 13.2 will have it um, uh, turned on by default. Um, uh, Mark did the work to um, to address the, the stack address randomization, um, replacing the the initial um, stack gap um, notation with a. Um, uh, I'm not sure what the exact word I want to use to describe this, but just a uh, you know a more uh, consistent maybe um, approach um, and uh, semi half folks are doing the same thing, uh, same kind of thing with um, the, the, the shared page where the VDSO um, uh, lives um, now. So that's in, in review. That's all there's the, the link uh, here is a, is a link to the fabricator review. Um, and then the, yeah, the name of by default is, um, uh, is the change in main that, that turned it on and, and we'll, we'll, um, we'll get merged. Um, the, let's see, one of the ones I wanted to talk a little bit about, um, I guess there's uh, both both the MMAP, MProtect, Maximum Page Protection, and init all zero, init all pattern. Um, the second one is just a build knob, basically, that uses a flag that that, um, that Clang introduced. Um, both of these changes, uh, the, the MMAP, MProtect, Page Protection, and, and this one are things that came from uh, Cherry BSD. And I think we're not done necessarily um, as you know, for, for a security for vulnerability mitigation um, reason, just sort of uh, it might have been uh, at least in the case of 
of MMAP, MMAP and MProtect, it's, it's sort of uh, an incidental change to um, that, that's necessary to kind of fundamentally um, uh, accommodate um, what uh, what Cherry BSD and uh, requires as far as the interface to to MMAP or MProtect. Um, and so, uh, you know, this this came into FreeBSD from Cherry BSD and, and is um, uh, is not yet um, sort of fully deployed in a, in a mitigation context, but it's something that um, I, I, I'm interested in trying to pursue. Um, and so basically what, what the change does is um, it adds a, a macro that lets you specify not only the protection flags um, that you're currently intending to use um, for MMAP or MProtect, but, um, but also the, the maximum ones. So if you don't, um, you can request a um, uh, you can request uh, rest you know, uh, a subset of protections for the current uh, mapping, but allow, uh, but, but report to the kernel that you will um, need a broader set in the future. Um, or you can you know, uh, not uh, provide the, the extended set. And the intent is then that if you, you, know, if you ask for memory that's um, uh, maximum protection is is read, um, then you know, that memory won't be uh, won't be able to be um, changed in the in the future to add protections that, that don't um, uh, that aren't requested at the time that it's it's allocated or um, or set. Um, and this comes out of the the need. Um, uh, you know, it's it's sort of a direct consequence of um, Cherry ABI's um, uh, interface, where if you're passing in a capability. To reference um, uh, some um, uh, passing in or, or, or receiving a capability to some memory, um, you know, if if, if you don't have um, uh, if you don't have the ability to to write through that capability when you get it, you can't just you can't add it later. Um, and so that you know, this is is something that um, is is a consequence of, of of Cherry, but I think is is interesting in in the um, general FreeBSD context uh, as well. Um, Mark or uh, Marius, any, anything you want to comment on any of these? Um, I don't think I have anything to add there now. Um, nice. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll, um, uh, I'll try and turn at least like the, the last two that aren't links right now um, into links for the, the slides that actually get published. Um, Showing the actual commits, or at least the, or, or, you know, a relevant or significant commit related um, to this. Um, uh, in IRC, um, Salusan says that uh, we should have a, a dedicated web page. I mean, a key page maybe um, that shows the, the vulnerability mitigations that we have. Um, I think that's a yeah, a reasonable, um, uh, a reasonable comment. Um, uh, basically, you know, I can start with this little list I put together here. Um, this is not an exhaustive list. Uh, Andy points out in IRC that we have uh, kernel pack and for thread SSP on ARM64 as well. Um, there's, you know, there's there's a number of other things that have have, have gone in. Um, I mentioned um, SMAP and uh, uh, PAN here, um, also uh, SMAP uh, and PXN uh, uh, privilege. Uh, Star uh, uh, never. Um, uh, it's not an exhaustive list here, but uh, yeah, I think that's a good point. We can. Um, uh, we we absolutely should have this on a uh, on page with um, information about um, probably what versions these showed up in, and and you know if there's any. Um, uh, for some of these, um, there there's no user facing control or knob or anything. It just you know. It's a change that just exists and, and provides its and serves its purpose. Um, some of these have syscontrol knobs that can be turned on or off, or you know, involve um, either making use of them um, at application, uh, like at the uh, application creation time. Um, so, for example, the, the MMAP and MProtect page protection. You know, that's that's something that um, may well be something that is is applied. As you're writing the software, not um, as a something an object and end user would turn on. Um, so providing that kind of information for all of these, you know, uh, how to use them, how to how they they're configured, etc., would be would be reasonable. And then we can flush it out with um, with the full set of, of different ones. 
um, uh, Dead Rip asks if it would make sense to add these security things to um, either the Arch or security GAN pages. Um, I think that's that's also um, uh, also useful. I mean, I think um, things like um, uh, this, the supervisor mode um, uh, uh, access prevention uh, things that that almost kind of fits into Arch, right? Like in that um, x86 and ARM64 have very similar types of things. And I think, you know, being having having a list of uh, this architecture implements this type of uh, of protection and it's called this for this architecture, that, that seems like something that's um, that's reasonable. Um, yeah, I think that um, whether it's arch security or uh, mitigations that someone suggested, um, I think both having a, a list on the website and perhaps with more information, but also a um, uh, a man page for it makes, uh, makes sense, yeah. Before we jump uh, into the next topic, I mm -hmm. believe there is another question to Mark about the um, fuzzers. Uh, basically, who has access to the reproducers generated by large fuzzer instance? Uh, there, I mean, so Fizzbot is the one public instance that I'm aware of, and there's no um, there's no restriction of access. So yeah, you, you have access to all the reproducers. Um, and I don't really think it makes much sense to like, um, you know, it's, it's not like is, it's a, a sorry? The point here is that the uh, reproducers can just basically have a zero day uh, box. Right? Certainly. Yeah. Um, but I mean, you know, it's it's not hard to, to set up a local syscaller or a syscaller instance that will find those same reproducers as well. So I, I don't think there's really all that much to be gained from um, uh, uh, hiding them. And I, I, yeah, as far as I can tell, that's been the syscaller project's policy as well. The same is true of Linux. All those reproducers are available, and I mean they've they've had CVEs where um, you know that that were you know where the underlying bug was was available or discovered and and had a reproducer and was in public. Um, so yeah, given how easy it is to, to set up an instance locally and find the same bugs yourself, um, I, yeah, I don't think there's, there's much sense in, um, in restricting that. And I mean, it's because, because, you know, this whole scheme is quite non-deterministic, you know, one instance of syscaller might find bugs that are not found by a different instance, where you might have some, um, slightly different configuration, like say the number of CPUs, or the amount of memory, um, uh, things like that, which kind of, you know, end up triggering different races um, or, or whatever, you know, inject whatever amount of non-determinism is needed to, to discover a new bug. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, uh, so, uh, yeah, I guess that's, that's the answer to that. Anyone can, can look at those reproducers, anyone can run syscaller and find bugs and, and get their own reproducers. Yeah, I mean, fundamentally, if, um, you know, if, if, if running syscaller was either extremely complicated to do, or you know, was it was um, uh, only available under some license agreement, and and very you know, there's restricted um, uh, access to Syscaller, or it was extremely expensive to run, or something. Then you know, I could see someone making a, an argument that oh, we should um, embargo the the reproducers and the the results, um, and, but. Um, and I'm not saying that I would make that argument. I'm saying that there's there's a plausible argument to be made there. Um, but I think in the you know the reality is that um, it's trivial for anyone else to start finding these, and there's really nothing at all to be gained to try and um, limit the access to to the reproducers. Like the the what we really need to do is run more syscaller instances um, and. Um, or have more eyes that are looking and, at and have more people looking at uh, at reports and get fixes in as quickly as we can um it came up in the last topic um uh, a little bit that one of the things that would be very very nice to do um is when a kernel change is you know in review or submitted as a pull request or someone has um a bunch of changes in a, a whip branch um somewhere to be able to in a ideally automated fashion um, spin up a syscaller instance and you know run syscaller uh, run sysbot against uh, or run syscaller against the proposed change for you know four hours a day whatever whatever kind of makes sense but um, but yeah I mean um, we we really want to be in a case in a position where we have a you know either 
uh, ideally not no um, kind of known open just always happen types of issues um, but are at least at least very very rare right so that um, you can run it for a day and um, either it doesn't find anything new or, you know, maybe occasionally it finds something new, but, or finds a report, but it's something. That you know, um, anyway, that, that is something that I think will be, be very, uh, very compelling for us to, to do. Also, um, I really want to make it easier for, uh, I want I shouldn't say I want to make it easier. I, I want it to be easy for downstreams um, or third party projects to be able to spin up their own um, syscaller instances um, against, you know, either stock free BSD or their own, um, their own derivative, um, you know, ideally, like you could, if you have some Oracle cloud credentials, right, you can just run one Terraform uh, uh, script and, and have basically a, a sys, SysBot of your own instantiated and, and running against your, um, your, your private Git tree or whatever it might be. So we have another question about syscaller and it's basically, is there any documentation how to run it by yourself? Yeah, uh, there's a there's a docs folder in the in the syscaller repo, which is um, GitHub, uh, Google syscaller, um, and there's some setup instructions for running it on or for for fuzzing FreeBSD. So you can so I mean I don't I don't want to go off into the weeds too much because there's there's quite a lot of information about this on the internet already. But the, you know the general gist of it is you you have a host which runs a sort of manager which um, has the ability to spin up any number of VMs which run the, the, the kernel being fuzzed. So the manager can be Linux or FreeBSD or whatever you want. And you can use, you know, QMU or Beehive or, or um, I think only GCE at the moment, as far as cloud providers go. So there, there's a bunch of different ways to run uh, uh, guests that get fuzzed. Um, so depending on what your requirements are and what hardware you have available to you or, or don't have, um, yeah, the, the, the setup might be slightly different, but yeah, in general, you, you know, you grab the sources, build them, Write a little configuration file which specifies a bunch of um, uh, you know parameters, things like the number of uh, VMs and, and resources to give it, and uh, you can take um, a FreeBSD image, like a VM image, and use that as the as the, uh, as the base for for everything. Um, so I can perhaps put a link on the Dev Summit wiki um, after after the talk's over. But uh, yeah, the, there is a docs folder with with FreeBSD specific setup and instructions. Just out of curiosity, have you used any reproducers to generate a um, regression test uh, for free so, free uh, so there isn't really, so there's nothing that currently runs as part of our post commit CI. Um, I collect all of the reproducers in a, in a repository and I do, I have a bit of automation for running them, but um, that's not hooked into anything. And I, I can see that Peter Holm checks some of those into stress too, and those do get run regularly. Um, so if, if you look in the stress two directory, you'll see probably 60 or 70 different syscaller reproducers. Um, and they're, they're still available in, in sysbot as well. Um, uh, so the, you know, I mean, th those are available forever. And, and yeah, again, I, I, I personally collect the ones that I've, um, found using a private instance. Um, but yes, they, they do tend to turn into useful regression tests. Um, and as Ed said, you know, um, uh, a pre-commit CI job that would fuzz uh, a patch set for for several hours would be would be a huge uh, a huge help because I mean I do that for for developers even now but it's it's currently manual like they have to mail me and say oh hey can you fuzz this so automating that is is going to be one of my or, I mean it's something I'm actively working on. Um. I see one more question um, over on the YouTube uh, stream. Um, can this color be used for bare metal or VMware VMs? I would love to see this used on ARC64. Um, can it be used on bare metal? I think so. I've never done that. Um, and I think there's a bunch of caveats with doing that because, you know, this color does all sorts of horrible things to the file system. Um, so you, after a reset, you know, after a panic, say you really want to restore the system to, um, uh, uh, you know, it's sort of a known good state. So if you boot disklessly, um, that might be pretty, that might be pretty easy to do. Um, I, yeah, I, I do think it's possible. Um, I just don't have much personal experience with it. You might have to trawl through the, the syscaller docs a bit. Um, and VMware, uh, I'm not sure if, 
So I mean, uh, Syscaller has a bunch of sort of drivers for different hypervisors. Uh, there is a VMware driver. I've never used it myself. Um, so, I mean, in principle, the answer is yes, but uh, you'd have to look into it a bit more. I mostly fuzz with Beehive and Syspod uses GCE, um, but you can use yeah, QMU with KVM if you're on Linux or, or um, uh, I think there's GVisor support as well. Um, so there's, there's quite a few different ways to, yeah. So yeah, the answer is a qualified yes. All right, and I think with that, we'll um, uh, go on to uh, our last topic, um, which is proactive security, um, which included both Capsicum and uh, Cherry, but um, we, uh, first of all, don't have enough time, and uh, Brooks um, talked about Cherry extensively uh, already, so um, we'll just, we'll, we'll focus just on Capsicum for this, um, uh, this topic. So uh, if you haven't heard about Capsicum, it's a lightweight uh, OS capability and sandbox frame framework, which basically, I mean, putting it in simple words, this is how we would like to sandbox our processes. And the main idea of it is that, you know, uh, you don't have any access to the global namespace. So for example, if you want to open some uh, connection, remote connection, or you want to open some file, you have to delegate this uh, to the different a process who actually have the capability to do so or capability to the um, file that, that you want to have. And um, to make it easier for people to use it, we also develop a service called Casper, which is basically a library which allows us to um, access in a secure way to different uh, namespaces. Um, and in um, uh, recently, we developed two major um, services, the file system one and the network one, uh, which basically allows you to access those two namespaces. Um, unfortunately, we still see um, quite small uh, adaptations uh, in um, the user land applications. And uh, this is something that we, I personally would like to discuss and, uh, you know, if you have uh, any ideas or you um, try it and you think that it's um, still uh, challenging to sandbox um, applications using those uh, two um, services, and then I would like to know about that. Uh, Besides that, recently we also put a lot of effort with uh, fully uh, supporting Beehive. Currently, if you are using um, a feature called um, checkpoints, if I recall correctly, uh, then uh, the Capsicum and uh, Capsicum support is disabled, and there was a major uh, work done um, to to support it, but it's still um, in review. Uh, as well, uh, there was a lot of work put by uh, Mateusz um, in uh, area of optimizations, uh, especially in the um, kernel space. Um, for example, uh, how we calculate uh, capabilities and how we use them. So this was a very, very, uh, very extensive work from, from him. And if we go to the next slide, this is a sm very small summary what uh, happened recently in, in Capsicum world. And basically, I would really would like to have uh, some uh, discussion of what is still missing in Capsicum and what we can actually do to make it easier for, for developers to uh, work with it and use it in their applications. Because um, I feel that uh, the... Um, adaptation process in, in uh, FreeBSD um, slow down. Uh, and this is something that I would really like to uh, get on track with that. Um, I also think that if you are a, a new person, newcomer in FreeBSD, um, it's a very good project to uh, look into because basically you have to work with the uh, uh, Unix tools that you use every day and try to sandbox them. So this is something that can um, create a great opportunity for contributions as well. Yeah, um, I think um, I would very much um, like to see um, uh, a focus on uh, Capscom uh, adopting Capsicum in um, 
third party ports of particular interest to us. So, you know, things like uh, if we're using the Git, um, uh, uh, Git server um, uh, or uh, OpenB uh, from, from the OpenBSD project um, got uh, Game of Trees. Um, one of my co-op students did some work to, to start applying Capsicum to um, to that, unfortunately, the the term ended, and we haven't been able to continue um, with that, that under the the co-op program. But um, but certainly, you know, there's there's a uh, a handful of relatively easily identified ports um, that I think would be very um, useful uh, targets for um, for Capsicum applications. Uh, yes. Yeah, so if you haven't uh, came across Capsicum before, there is a nice uh, wiki page uh, on uh, FreeBSD Wiki. Uh, which describes some um, targets that you can find useful as well. But uh, I think that, uh, like Ed mentioned, that that's, this is a very good idea also to put some uh, third party ports that we would uh, like to see, or we think that would be quite easy to sandbox at this point. Um, so from IRC, we have a comment uh, from Crest that says, uh, IMO Capsicum is a really nice and clean design, which is why it fails to gain adoption. Uh, <laughs> Um, question about whether hard, fetch... hard to not, agree, not to agree. <laughs> Does fetch use Capscom? Um, uh, uh, yeah. Um, so uh, I, I don't believe fetch does. I right don't know either, but let me just quickly yeah. track that. Um, be I looked at Capscom really early on and didn't quite get it. I need to look at it again. Uh, I, I think that is. Um, um, I think that is fundamentally something that we need to try to address through either tutorial videos or documentation or tutorials about applying it or whatever. Um, because I think one of the key, um, the key parts is you need to sort of have that light bulb moment to realize the distinction between, um, you know, a syscall limitation, like basically reducing classes of syscalls, which Capsicum does, but it's, it's sort of incidental to the real, um, the real point, right, of, of basically once, once that like idea of global namespaces and ambient authority as what you're limiting um, uh, kind of clicks, then the fact that certain syscalls are not available, you know, it's not, it, it, that's sort of the natural consequence of, well, those syscalls only, only act on um, global namespaces, and so that's 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 the that's the fundamental reason why they're not available. It's not because they're it, it, it's not because that syscall is dangerous. It's because that syscall just is meaningless when your model is that the um, uh, global namespace or ambient authority. So, so basically, what I think it's it's maybe uh, straightforward is that you have to have capability to use particular syscall, right? For example, the file descriptor to. Uh, from which you have to read. And if there is a syscall that, you know, don't have any particular capabilities, it's just uh, denied or uh, restricted in Capsicum. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, there is a question on Zoom. Uh, so uh, basically if you have, um, uh, the question is, um, how does Capsicum interact with OPATH, empty path, and the add syscalls? Is the path only descriptor already a capability for accessing the file? So uh, the capability is actually the file descriptor to particular file or to the directory in which the directory uh, in which the file is. So, for example, if you want to open some particular file, you have to have a uh, descriptor to this directory in which the file is, or you have to uh, ask the uh, process that have access to this file to open it for it and pass it through, for example, Unix domain socket. Mm. Okay, I think um, uh, John wants us to wrap up um, uh, shortly. So uh, we can continue this discussion, uh, certainly in the, um, the hallway track. Um, but uh, with that, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mark and Reyes, and uh, we'll talk again in the hallway track, hallway track in a moment. Thank you. Thanks. All right, thank you all. Um, as Ed noted, it's time now for our last break of the day. Um, 
We're gonna have another break for about 20 minutes or so, and then we'll come back. Um, we have one more talk today, which is uh, uh, kind of more of a laid back, just um, open-ended talk with Jordan Hubbard talking about some of FreeBSD's early history. Um, so we'll see you back in about 20 minutes or so.
Check, check. Hey, Jordan. Hey, John. Can you hear me okay? Yep. You've got a couple of minutes left until you, you can start. But. Yeah, yeah. They, they, uh, they asked me to join five minutes early just to do exactly this kind of subject. Yep. How are things going? Pretty good so far. Good. So do you have any idea what the hell we're talking about? Or is this going to be complete ad hoc impromptu it's, Q and A? Um, well, the, I mean, it's ad hoc. Um, but basically, it's a chance if you want to talk about kind of the early history of FreeBSD and um, some stuff that many people may not know, since we have developers who have joined in more recent years. Um, even stuff that I don't know, since I've, my, I only joined in about 99 or so, so. Okay, yeah, I mean, I can, uh, if you want me to monologue just sort of off the cuff for the first couple of minutes and introduce myself and the history, I can do that and then people can start with questions and we can take it into a more interactive conversation. Okay, that sounds good. Okay. Cool, we have three minutes left. <sighs> You're going to have to lie to the side of the keyboard, not on the keyboard. Will I have any idea uh, who's on the other end? Is there like a camera pointing at the audience, or is it just we think I mean, there's people there? There are folks on Zoom. There's also folks who are like watching on like. We live stream to YouTube and they'll, I'll try to proxy questions from IRC. Um, okay. Okay. So, do you have a um, any sense of the developer uh, attendance this year? Good hundreds of people register or thousands? Or um, thousands? No, not thousands. <laughs> we had 130 register. Um, okay. But that's, I mean, it's spread out among time zones, especially being virtual. It's hard to get a sense of kind of butts and share at any given point in time. Yeah. 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 Believe it or not, that's an actual HR term here. BIS. I had to ask what that meant. What's, what's, what's BIS on the headcount? It's butts and seats. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, I find it funny. Okay, um, so for folks watching the FreeBSD Developer Summit, welcome back from our last break of the day. Um, I'm here with Jordan Hubbard, who is, I hope I say this accurately, one of the founders of the FreeBSD project. Um, just here to chat about kind of some of the early history and things that went on in FreeBSD that many of us may not be as familiar with um, and kind of go from there. So Jordan, maybe if you wanna start by introducing yourself um, and talking about maybe 
how you came to be involved with FreeBSD and kind of how you got started working with BSD in the first place? So yes, I am Jordan Hubbard and I am one of the three original founders of the FreeBSD project. Uh, Rod Grimes and Nate Williams were the other two. Um, but of course, if you really wanna, I think be th truly accurate, you have to include the 386 BSD founders as well. Uh, so uh, uh, folks like Terry and uh, uh, Bill and many other patch kit maintainers. Um, so that's actually kind of, I think a good, a good segue to, to how it all started. So it's, you know, picture it's uh, late eighties and you have BSD is a well-established operating system running on VAXs, uh, running at the core of uh, Sun OS, which was uh, what predated Solaris, which was essentially a kind of a rewrite based on system five. Um, but Solaris was really, was really popular in its day. And that was essentially a straight up uh, BSD port to uh, to multiple architectures as Sun was evolving as a company. You had Altrix, which was BSD for DEC or Digital Equipment Corporation. Uh, you have my cat stepping on my mask. Step away. Go on. Uh, and so um, BSD was actually robust and commercial grade and present in, in quite a lot of products. And of course, it was. Uh, the operating system of choice at UC Berkeley, where I also worked uh, for a time uh, in, in the 80s. So the only real barrier to entry for, for BSD as a technology, uh, because it had been widely ported uh, to all sorts of different architectures and 99% and of it, or you know, that's a made up, uh, it's a large percent of it, a percentage of it was already open source. The real barrier to entry was that it ran on expensive, uh, mini computers and mainframes. So not everybody could afford a VAX. And so 386 BSD was the first um, truly open source BSD that filled in the missing pieces that you couldn't get from the, from the CSRG on their uh, CSRG Net2 or BSD uh, tapes, and they were called tapes because they were literally tapes you'd order from uh, from Berkeley, uh, and they'd send you most of BSD, but not all of it, not all the low-core uh, stuff, the, the, the VM um, subsystem for a particular architecture, um, you know, a lot of the low-level kernel pieces for commonly av available hardware, like, you know, 386 uh, and 486 was missing. So that's really where, you know, I think we have a lot to give uh, Bill Jolitz and, and his, uh, his band of 386BST hackers, they're, they're just due because they, they broke BSD free into the PC space, which is when it really went mainstream. And so the 386BST uh, distribution went for a while. It was a massive stack of floppies. And I remember, uh, I think I was one of the people hacking on the early installer that would allow you to to copy your 386BSD onto floppies uh, in the distribution and then walk up to a 386 or 486 and insert the first floppy, boot from it, <laughs> and it would ask you, okay, floppy one of 97 done, right? Or whatever, man, it was a large number. And it would just sit there and read floppy after floppy and copy it to the disk after formatting the disk. And then finally, at the end of all that, if you didn't lose a floppy disk, yeah, you'd reboot and you'd be into BSD. You'd be into BSD on the PC, and that was that was really revelatory uh, because again, up until then, if you wanted to experience BSD as an operating system, you had to have a Sun workstation, or you had to have a Vax, or a Tahoe, or a Pyramid, or any one of the you know sort of mini computers at the time uh, that ran it, and were hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not millions of dollars in some cases. So now I can run it on something that I can buy at the local store, uh, it sits on my desk. And that's that's really where where we caught fire. And, and around the same time, interestingly enough, this this guy named Linus Torvalds, uh, who is I think a research student at uh, in, in a Finnish university, had written a very simple kernel that just had two processes in it. I remember I remember it. I downloaded it and ran it, and it had two processes A and B. And A would talk to B, and B would talk to A, and they would each print, "Hi, you know, I'm here." And that was that was where Linux was starting out. Was just a complete from scratch. 
hey, let's see if I can write a kernel uh, kind of effort. Um, so, you know, props to Linux too, because, you know, BSD had a huge head start. It just needed to be ported essentially to the x86. Uh, and Linux was complete from scratch effort. Uh, and I think that attracted a lot of people, you know, obviously to that effort as well, because BSD was, was well established. It was that, you know, it was your dad's operating system. It was a commercial OS that ran on you know, dozens of platforms already. But obviously I stuck with it. And when 386 BSD kind of ran out of steam, petered out, um, we started FreeBSD. The, the last few uh, patch, patch kit maintainers got together and said, well, we don't want this to end and we want to continue this and we love the centralized source model and we love being able to build everything from source kernel to all the user land uh, and uh, that's when i got involved in you know the, creating the ports collection and the packaging tools and system install was really just to, to to not have to put everything into the core into the base of freebsd but still have a way of adding on all your you know your favorite shell your favorite editor your favorite compiler tools and so on uh, but still in a controlled way. And honestly, FreeBSD is still one of the few operating systems out there where you can you can build everything from a source, you know, with one or two commands. That's the key thing. You know, there's wrappers for everything. The ports collection is essentially just a huge set of wrappers, 27,000, 28,000, however many there are right now. Uh, wrappers using make, not my proudest decision but it, it works right and and uh it, it, you know and it, it works pretty well actually so you know that's a pr pretty amazing that it's scaled out to that extent and you can make world as you all know in, in your user source directory for freebsc itself the core and that's still something you can't do in another in, uh, you know, since minix died <laughs> there really hasn't been another operating system where you could go and just build the entire thing with uh, with a, with one or two commands, so I think that's why you know it still thrives, and certainly it's something I tried to do again with Mac ports when I was at Apple, and create wrappers for everything and create a robust you know, collection of, of third party sources and, and binaries and packages from from one re repo that you could check out, uh, and certainly other other groups like Conda and uh, 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 Pip, uh, you know, at the, the PSF, if, you know, have taken sort of very much the same approach. Uh, let's create a repository, let's create a single source of truth with you know, sort of different aspects of the developer to be you know, stable and so on. And, uh, but but FreeBSD was one of the first to do that. So um, yeah, I think FreeBSD has, and BSD itself has always been characterized by firsts. BSD was you know first system to really support TCP IP, first system to have a virtual, uh, Memory management, uh, you know, PDP eight wasn't wasn't didn't have a virtual memory, and the first uh, long file names, uh, fast file system, uh, Kirk McKusick and and uh, everyone at CSRG did a lot of pioneering work with BSD, and so it was always my hope that 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 ethos, that mindset, of both having everything well organized so that you can just step into it and learn just a few simple commands and do everything with those few simple commands see everything have all the sources there have all the wrappers and take them apart and clone them um and then also doing innovative things at the same time i think those are the, for me at least the two core principles that the previous was founded on so i think that's a quick history lesson and uh, i can turn it over to questions or we can talk about other things okay well i've got a couple of questions uh, we can use to keep um going um, so somebody's asked, um, I guess they were looking back at the 1.0 release time, which predates me. And they said that the first release they can see is named Epsilon, and they're curious what happened to Alpha through Delta. <laughs> wow, great question. Um, honestly, I think Alpha through, Del Alpha through Delta were so bad uh that i i don't recall there being any great appetite for ship, shipping those versions they did exist um but i think what it was it was like one of those you know kind of uh rolling rolling release kind of deals where it's like okay now we have a release candidate let's oh no that's not that can't be it all right well we can't just reuse the same name because nobody everybody would get confused so let's bump you know let's bump a letter uh so you know alpha beta uh, and so on were were uh I think you know 
pretty, pretty, pretty nasty. Uh, and don't forget, even back then, we supported a lot of different ways of installing it. Uh, you could install over FTP. You could install over floppies. Uh, you could install over parallel line IP. Remember that? Using your printer, your parallel printer port uh, from another system to send the media. Yeah, it was way faster than serial. Uh, so we were also evolving a lot of the release engineering uh, and the installation experience to try to make it accessible. Because again, if you couldn't install it fairly easily in a variety of ways, we, we were never going to get any any user community built around it. So I think Epsilon was the first one that we thought was worth actually putting on a CD. Um, and I, I do have actually every single previous D version on CD to my left. It still occupies a place on my shelf. So not that I ever unwrapped them. They're all still in the shrink rack. So. <laughs> I have a similar, mine doesn't start until 216 or so, but I have a similar collection. Most of them shrink wrapped myself. So yeah, um, I, think I, have, I think I have five 1.0 CDs just because, you know, that one's significant. And I, I've had, I started with more. Right? I used to remember, I used to walk around with boxes of free CDs from yes. one Creek City Rum. And so I'd go to user groups and I would just, you know, I'd practically pit them in, pitch them into the crowd like t shirts. Uh, that was part of our early uh, arrangement with Walnut Creek CD ROM, is they could sell it. We wouldn't charge any money for our efforts. You know, they could just make money on it, but they would give the user community a certain uh, uh, umpteen thousand CDs. And occasionally I'd pack those into my luggage. I think I went to the first uh, European FreeBSD conference in RM, if I remember correctly. There's a place where we all hacked our Toshiba librettos to get from 50 megahertz to 70 megahertz, you know, by soldering a couple jumper wires, because the Toshiba libretto was the preferred free BSD, you know, mini laptop of choice. Uh, but I bought, I brought boxes through the airport of CDs, and then just the same thing, you know, Johnny Appleseed, just here, have a free CD. So. So you have another question. Someone asked about NetBSD um, because we know NetBSD started about the time as FreeBSD. So kind of what was your perspective on how that beginning, you know, the, kind of the divergence early on and kind of, you know, how did you see them being different at the start? Yeah, I would say that in some ways, NetBSD and FreeBSD were almost like the continuation of certain factions within the CSRG. Uh, because, you know, uh, for those, those who don't know, you know, CSRG was the original, uh, I think, computer systems research group. Uh, sometimes say people say computer science research groups. I, I've heard different uh, academic expansions, but the CSRG at UC Berkeley was where BSD started. And there was kind of a, a, a part of it that I actually worked with in, in the early 80s who just wanted to port BSD to everything. Right, they they saw that as the way to to being ubiquitous. So they were the ones who like did the early Tahoe port. I remember, you know, there were all kinds of Tahoe tapes coming out. Most of us were saying, "What the heck is a Tahoe?" Right, it was a pretty obscure machine uh, even for its time. Um, but it was one of the first, uh, you know, sort of non-vax versions. And of course, BSD ran on on uh, the PDP eight or PDP eleven as well. Right, there was you know two dot nine, two dot X. That's a, like a different fork of BSD to run on a on a machine with no uh, uh, MMU. Uh, so PDP folks were running BSD, Vax folks were running BSD because of course DEC was really re really generous with their university grants back then. So pretty much if you were at university in the United States, you had some digital equipment corporation stuff around campus. So BSD ran on that stuff sort of first and foremost, and so and that group within the CSRG really wanted to run everywhere. The FreeBSD folks, you know, came from the 386 BSD ethos, which is, OMG, we finally unlocked a uh, low cost, easily accessible computing with BSD. And so FreeBSD folks wanted the early, early, I think Project Charter was in fact, we don't want to run on everything. We just want to run really, really well on one thing. And that was x86. Now, eventually, you know, and of course, NetBSD, you know, of course it runs NetBSD in the slogans, right? At least a joke, NetBSD runs on your toaster, runs on your fridge, your microwave. Uh, and it did support many, many, many architectures. And FreeBSD only sort of grudgingly got into the multiple architecture game. And honestly, I think that started with the alpha, the deck alpha. 
because we needed a 64-bit validation platform. This is all back when you know, Intel was 32-bit only. Um, and so the alpha was going to be our proving ground. We, we all know how popular that architecture turned out to be, but <laughs> but it, it was an important it was an important milestone, and it was the first non x eighty six port. So at that point, we kind of slowly opened the gates and said, oh, "All right, maybe Spark, maybe maybe PowerPC, maybe you know MIPS." Uh, and so I think FreeBSD still, still has kind of that that tension of saying, "How many architectures is enough?" And what defines a tier one architecture? Is it number of seats? Is it number of users? Is it the amount of money it makes somebody? I mean, you know, it's it's a it's a tough call. Whereas NetBSD never had to make that call. Really, it's like, yeah, we'll run on everything. I mean, case in point, I built an obscure PC. The PC is really the wrong word to call it a PC five thirty two, and it was based on the National Semiconductor thirty two five thirty two platform. And there was a bunch of us psychos, basically, that loved the National Semiconductor 32K uh, CPU architecture. I mean, I wrote assembly for it because I loved the instruction set so much. And so I wrote the bootloader for the PC532 in assembly. And I wrote, of course, it was based on fourth, right? And I, uh, I wrote the IO subroutines and everything in assembly. And then, of course, we needed a, a Unix to run on it. And first we ran Minix for a while because that was a fairly straightforward port. But guess which BSD was willing to run on the PC 532 of which only 150 of which I think ever existed. Mine being one of them, NetBSD. NetBSD ran on the PC 532. They were that friendly to, to different architectures that they would even run on something as obscure and, and one-off as that. So there, there's, there's a difference in a nutshell, right? NetBSD runs on different things just because it can, and it's fun, which yeah, is cool, um, which is cool. <laughs> no, it is. Um, yeah. For reference, um, in FreeBSD, we actually removed Spark 64 two years ago and MIPS last year. So somewhat. Uh, you made Warner Lush cry. Actually, Warner is the one who got to remove MIPS. So. <laughs> okay. All right. Yes. <laughs> I, so, I don't think there were many tears when he did it. I, I think uh, it was more okay. relief. All right. All right. Well, yeah, yeah, man should always shoot his own dog, right? <laughs> Something like that, yeah. Um, let's see some more questions. Someone asked, if you could go back and change something about ports in a major way, what would you do differently? Yeah, I've asked myself that question several thousand times. Um, I wouldn't have used make. Uh, I mean, again, make is such a simple thing to wrap stuff in, but I mean, make is essentially just a, just a wrapper around shell, if you really think about it. Uh, and, and so thinking of, you know, tens of thousands of semi-documented shell scripts, uh, the very simple rules engine that'll run them in a certain order, um, is not the, it was not the most robust architecture. Um, and, and, and the worst, the worst thing about that choice was that there was nothing that could be really machine parsed. So you know, to this day, if you want to be able to say, well, I'm going to create a special port system that's going to, you know, like Pudrera, which, you know, did, to, to its credit, managed to do it. But, you know, a, a much harder job to take a bunch of shell code and run it, you know, in parallel uh, and also know sort of the security implications of every single binary you're running and every single file you're accessing and just all the runtime behavior versus saying, hey, let's build a ports collection that's all, you know, in a de descriptive data format. Um, and then just have like a very simple, you know, DSL, which does the specialized things. But hindsight is always 2020. And, and honestly, if I had set out to write that system, then I would have had to pick a file format and I would have said XML and everyone would have screamed and, and we would have had a huge fight about which metadata format to use. And then of course, the set of primitives in my little DSL would be constantly exploding because, oh, you missed this case, you missed this case. And then everybody would complain that it was too restrictive and too limiting and too hard to, to, to write a new port. Um, you know, to be clear, Mac ports, Macports uses Tickle. I was about so, to say Tickle. Yeah. So every every Macport is a program, and so it's essentially just running code. 
Mac, when you build something with MapWorks, you descend all the way through the hierarchy of, of needs, right? As you're building your your big meta package or something, it's just running tickle code. And and I wrote a lot of the primitives in Tickle. We basically wrote raw C for walking file systems and doing operations on files and whatnot. And we and we avoided shell to as much as we could to try to get, create it all in raw Tickle so that we could actually instrument all the entry points and exit points from the Tickle code and trace it all and create you know big trace files to say, okay, what exactly did you do and why did you do it? Um, but in hindsight, was that really all necessary? Not really. The, the homebrew folks went and just said, we're going to use Ruby for all of the things and we're not going to instrument much. And their recipes are very popular on the Mac. So probably you could argue that Mac ports was, was over-engineered and it used an obscure language uh, at that uh, to create all this traceability and and sandboxing and it, does, it even goes down to syscall tracing and stuff on the Mac to figure out exactly what the port is doing um, and again it's nice for creating hermetic sandboxes truly hermetic sandboxes and and, and building your uh, your DAGs right your build and run DAGs uh, as you execute the port and its tests and all of that stuff but it's a lot of work it's a huge amount of work so maybe I wouldn't have done anything different. Right? Maybe it's just enough exposed wiring that everybody can understand it easily, the, the, the FreeBSD ports collection, uh, even though you can't introspect it. And, and, and yes, the dreaded YAML programmer. Uh, so let's see, what else? I think Deb was asking about the history of FreeBSD and macOS. So that's, a, that's another popular question. Um, when I joined Apple in 2001, uh, they had kind of almost finished the whole Darwin next step uh, Mac OS 9 collision because it really sort of was. I mean, a bunch of things came out of the old Mac OS 9 code base, like a uh, open directory. And you know, so the authentication system, uh, the ability to speak Apple Talk, the ability to uh, you know, use the HFS, right? Uh, a lot of stuff came from the legacy Apple code base. and Obviously, even more stuff came from Next Step, which is the company that Apple acquired. So in 2001, I would really have said that Mac OS was a combination of Next Step and uh, Mac OS 9 or some of the code for Mac OS 9. And like an early, early sync up with, I think, the FreeBSD 4. something, 3. something user land because they were... There was a lot of stuff in Next Step that was pretty antiquated, right? I mean, Next Step was another early BSD fork. I think it was created around the 4.2 time frame, but don't quote me on that. Wikipedia will have a better, better answer than my brain. Um, so Next Step was an early BSD fork. So some folks at Apple before I got there had already done like a quick refresh and they'd grab some stuff from Next BSD, they'd grab some stuff from FreeBSD, they'd grab some, some stuff from the, the attic from all I could tell. Like, we had man pages that like declared themselves to be, you know, all tricks and stuff like that. So it was like, where did this come from? Uh, so 2001 to 2003 or so, I would say was spent in just cleaning up. And because I came directly out of the FreeBSD project, of course, I synchronized as much of the user land as possible. Uh, to FreeBSD, if only so that I had a unified source of provenance, right? It's like the vendor branch, right? You want to have one vendor branch so that, you know, you can see all of your changes and uh, clearly. So I, I kind of cleaned up the Mac OS vendor branch, so to speak, that came from FreeBSD. But the kernel has always been completely different, right? The kernel of Mac OS is called XNU, which is an acronym for XNU is not Unix. It's, it's based on, on mock. And you know this is this is early. Uh, a bunch of mock folks from Carnegie Mellon came along with with Next Step, so they had their own ideas about kernel design. And actually, a funny throwback there: before 386 BSD, there was actually another BSD that ran on the x86, but it was even harder to get a hold of, and it was called Lights, all capitals, L I T E S. And that was Mach 3.0 running as a true microkernel and a BSD single server running as a process, essentially. So all of BSD was a personality running outside of Mach. 
And I actually ran that and was part of the team that got exported to it and everything. So we we actually had x86 workstations based on lights. I remember working with Johannes Hollander in the early days on that. So even before 386 BSD, I was working on that. So of course, when I went to Apple, I came back and was like, oh, my old friend Mach. Uh, uh, but all they've done is taken Mach 3.0 and and uh, linked it into the same address space. So they're not running the genuine single server model that Mach was originally designed to support, which by the way, GNU Herd also supports, uh, you know, the true out of process kernel, so to speak. Uh, and so, but, it, but the reason why it was merged and, and you know, homogenous kernel uh, was created was just performance, right? All that messaging was was a real overhead and, and we could definitely see it on the early 386s that i was using when i was doing lights development um it was just slow it worked though right but it was slow so mac os is a, the xnu kernel which is its own special beast io kit for drivers all kinds of special stuff in there very very mock based still using mock ipc uh and and uh mock ports and uh, some BSD stuff. So I think the net code was, was cloned out of some version of BSD. Uh, so TCP IP is, but again, Apple hacks on everything, right? And they hack on, hack on everything because they have to, not necessarily because they want to, right? Running, make, porting Mac OS to iOS or creating iOS out of Mac OS was a huge engineering challenge and required massive changes to, to you know, how memory was handled and a lot of you know, power performance. Uh, so FreeBSD is a component. It's a component, but it's not Mac OS. Very clearly not, right? Different, different kernel, different device driver model, different, different user land, but borrowing from FreeBSD. And other sources. But we at least homogenize the BSDs. In there. So it is, it is mostly free BSD for the parts that are open source BSD. And you can still grow, grab all that stuff from open source.apple.com. So it's just uh, visible. You can, you can go check it out for yourself. Hopefully that answers that question. Yep, I think so. Um, so, one question I had for you is um, maybe did you want to talk a little bit about uh, cdrom.com and getting involved with Walnut Creek and um, FTP.cdrom.com, which in its day was a big deal. It was. It was. Yeah. So, so you know, picture me. I'm living in in my house in or my apartment, I should say. I, I went to a, a house there for for a few years um, uh, in Dublin, Ireland, working for Lotus, uh, porting notes and Word and one two three uh, to I think it was seventeen different versions of Unix. So, so Lotus, Lotus put their Unix development uh, um, group, I think that's what we were called, um, in Ireland, as I always said, to prevent the, a, the Windows and OS2 antibodies in Boston from killing them. Uh, because, you know, 99% of Lotus was, was Windows and OS2. Right, the early note servers were OS2 servers. They actually ran quite well. OS2 was a decent operating system that was, you know, was pretty, pretty, pretty solid. So if you ran Lotus Notes, um, you had a note server running on OS, just a cluster of OS2 machines, and then you ran your Lotus Notes client, and it was you know, sort of a fancy distributed database with a little language that would let you kind of write your own uh, UIs on top of it. So we. We Lotus sold a lot of uh, stuff to to big companies like GM, for example. And every once in a while, like with GM, they would say, "We'll buy X number of thousand Lotus Note seats if you also run on SCO, or if you also run on Interactive Unix, or you run on HQX, or you run on SARS, or you run on uh, AIX." And so we became sort of the dumping ground for every possible Unix distribution you can imagine that anybody would buy a copy of a Lotus product for. So I'm incredibly frustrated at work every day trying to get our stuff to port to 17 different Linux, uh, Unix flavors. This is all pre-Linux. And then I come home and I work on a nice operating system, which was you know at the time of lights and then 386 BSD. And so I had a lot of computers at my house and a bunch of them were Amigas because I'm also an Amiga fan. 
actually have an Amiga 500 uh, recreation. Just I just ordered uh, to run some little software on, and and I went to my shelf thinking about how to get FreeBSD more out there. And I looked at all of my CDs. I had a huge, this is, CD was a huge way of distributing software because the internet was slow, right? And not everybody had a, even a 14, 4K modem. So I looked for the CDs with the highest production values I could find. And I pulled out the AmiNet CD, which was the Amiga network CD. And it had really nice artwork on it. And so I just opened it up and looked at it and I flipped it over and I said, who made this? And I saw a little company in Hall Creek CD-ROM in California. And there was a phone number on it. And I called the phone number and a guy named Jack answered. And uh, I, know, I know John's smiling now because he knew Jack. Uh, God rest his soul. He's no longer with us. But, but Jack was the kind of guy who was just crazy enough to take a, a phone call at 2 o'clock in the morning. I didn't, I didn't quite calculate the time difference so it ends up ends up by calling walnut creek cd rom like it was after midnight sometime and jack answers immediately hello and like oh hi i'm some random dude you've never heard of in dublin ireland who had just did a freebsd 1.0 epsilon release and it's a unix operating system for the pc and i would love to put it on cd what do you think would you be willing to publish it for us and he said sure <laughs> and honestly the rest is history um and in fact in sort of one of the greatest most spectacular corporate misses of all time we decided that we would create an ftp site and run freebsd on it david greenman went and you know i think you know built the hardware designed it with as many you know scuzzy controllers as you could fit and you know ftc run Become multiple evolutions. So, you know, I'm probably describing one somewhere in the middle. But uh, we, we, we ran it on the T1 line in the corporate office. And, and by the way, we did a couple of releases with Walnut Creek CD ROM and it actually started to sell pretty well. And they gave us those, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of CDs to hand out at conferences. And so word of mouth spread. And so it started to establish a pretty decent user base. So ftpcdrom.com kind of kind of also grows in popular as well as also the place to FTP uh, Sintel and a bunch of non FreeBSD stuff. So I don't want to make it sound like FreeBSD was the number one downloader there. And there was quite a few collections of stuff for Windows and OS2 and scientific and uh, you know, pictures. Right, we remember had all those different picture CD ROMs that had all the different catalogs. You know, the pictures that were free. So a lot of uh, photographic, uh, you know, uh, enthusiasts were downloading these collections, and it was all running on a single T1 line. What 1.54 megabits per second, uh, and uh, and it overloaded. It's, but there came a point, uh, I, at some point I had moved back to the United States because it decided, uh, yeah, you know, Dublin's great, but and Ireland's great. I lived in Galway too. So I, you know, lived in a couple parts of Ireland, and, but it's just like, I wanted to go back to Silicon Valley where I came from. So Walnut Creek City, Ram generally generally said, come back and work for us. And we couldn't work anymore because the T1 line was getting saturated. And so, and so, uh, we just looked, it was a blatancy. It was just terrible. It was like, oh, what's seeing in the network, the internet? Oh, the FTP site. So we moved it to, to a colo. And I remember, you know, how proud David was, you know, we got our first rack in a colo and he built ftpcrom.com there. And now we had all this transit and then it just exploded and it became the busiest FTP site on the internet. And we broke records. What was it when we, when we broke like a terabyte a day or something? Everyone was jumping up and down like, oh my God, a whole terabyte, uh, you know, which was a lot uh, for the day. And, and the miss was that we, we, we missed the internet, right? We were a CD-ROM publisher. So we just kept working on publishing CD-ROMs and nobody ever stopped to think, you know, I bet people would pay to, to put this on a, on a site somewhere and have somebody else run it for them, right? We could have created the, the first CDN, uh, you know, a network of, of FreeBSD machines and all the strategic colos and just kept adding storage and, and renting that storage out to other people. I think I had a conversation with Bob early on about, you know, something like that. I can't claim that I had that idea exactly. And he was like, nah. <laughs> 
Uh, so anyway, missed opportunities, but but yes, for a time we were we were we were kings of the internet. Lift we busy. So Peter Wem, you know, yeah. had a question. I guess he says at one point Walnut Creek moved the Walnut Creek office for Walnut Creek CD ROM moved to a chicken farm. I'm not aware of <laughs> what that is. Maybe you could provide some background. <laughs> Ah, I was, I don't remember that, but I do remember the chicken farm coming to Walnut Creek CD-ROM. Uh, so, so Bob Bruce, who was our CEO uh, through all of the Walnut Creek CD-ROM uh, era, right? There was multiple chapters in that, in that story, uh, mergers and acquisitions and things that happened subsequently. Right. But, but for the first part, Bob was, was the, the proprietor and, you know, Bob kind of, you know, set the culture. Uh, Bob would sleep on a board in a pallet rack. And when I mean a board, I mean like literally a piece of plywood. And we would go and say, Bob, don't you want a mattress? No, it's bad for you. Uh, it, but Bob was an ex-Marine. So he spent a lot, he probably spent too much time in the Marines. And so he had a certain, you know, standard of comfort, which was basically, you lay on the ground, it's fine. And so he um, he had a house nearby and he started raising chickens at the house. Uh, interestingly enough, I lived in that house for a little bit of time because when I came over from Ireland, I had nowhere to live yet. And you know, Bob said, hey, I got this empty house. Come stay in it. So I lived with the chickens too over there uh, and, and the pool that had turned into a biological experiment and a couple other interesting attributes. But hey, you know, it was a place to crash. It was fine. Uh, younger days. And the chickens went through several generations and eventually we decided that for safety reasons, the baby chicks should come to the office. So there was a room at the office at Wanna Creek Ron that was the chicken room. And lots of baby chicks lived in there because they were safe from raccoons and stuff. And then occasionally somebody would open the door of the chicken room and the chickens would escape. And so you'd have chickens running around the office and nobody thought anything of it because, you know, it's totally normal. Did I mention Walnut Creek City Rom was an interesting place? Yes, it is. I was only there for a few years, but it was, I remember, I'll share because I shared on IRC, when I came out to interview, and interview is an interesting word for my first week at Walnut Creek City Rom um, during my senior year, uh, I stayed with Bob. So I, I got the full Bob treatment. Um, yes, it's, it was an experience, that's for certain. Yes, yes. So. Bob, Bob is, is alive and well, living in Hawaii. So, so yeah, um, yeah. Anyway, that's that's the that's the Wanna Creek City Rom story. Trust me, it goes on and on. Interestingly, though, I'll just point out, I met my wife there. So oh, yes, that's right. Yes, yes, yes. I was I was the CTO and she was the CFO slash COO, and uh, we were we got married and we've been together ever since. So she's, Downstairs doing something as we speak. So one question we had um, from someone is, can you share your opinion on Grand Central Dispatch and what if FreeBSD can or should take from it? Oh, that's a great question. Um, so GCD is, is definitely one of the things I'm, I'm one of the things I'm proudest of in Mac OS because again, it, it came out, it came out of the BSD group. So the BSD group is something that Apple created kind of for me, right? They just named it the BSD group and say, there you go, go and be in charge of the BSD parts of, of Mac OS and, and later iOS and, and tvOS and all that stuff. So um, so the BSD group was actually pretty innovative, you know, if I don't say so myself. Um, and so we, we wanted to create a run loop for Mac OS. That was really where it started was we need a run loop so that we can deal with asynchronous events. So the reason I, I point that out is I think FreeBSD does in its user land or in its runtime have to be able to deal increasingly with asynchrony, right? In, in, in Linux, you already have Dbus, for example, which is one of the you know, fundamental plumbing uh, mechanisms and a lot of processes are consuming events dynamically uh, and doing things and generating their own events. And that's how the whole operating system stack works. Uh, but it's kind of a pain in the butt to program just to a raw run loop. So GCD took that early run loop idea and then we said, all right, well, we have we need to be able to, to 
put stuff into different parts of the run loop because we also had multiple run loops, right? We had to go run another run loop and then come back from that and then go into GCD because we, we weren't the first run loop or CF run loop, I think was the first one. Um, and so in order to unify all those different run loops, we had to create a flexible dispatching model. And it was uh, uh, Dave Z's uh, very uh, smart idea, I thought, to say, let's take the queue, the fundamental you know, uh, notion. So everything will just be a queue. And of course, you can nest queues. You can have queues that contain queues or queues that contain terminal objects to go execute. And because you can run things in the queue uh, in a fairly straightforward way, now you can have synchronous and asynchronous queues. So now you can sort of schedule things against a queue with either a sync or an async property. And uh, you can also synchronize in an asynchronous queue, which just says just block here until everything prior to you in the queue runs and then your thing will run. And so that and the nesting and the ability to flexibly have threads run these queues. And you know, you can start even with just one thread and every queue is just a continuation. Just you know, at the very end of the queue, it just looks for another queue to jump into. And so it's pure tail call sort of you know continuation uh, programming. But if you start getting genuinely concur concurrent, if things start to block, you can automatically respond more threads. So I'll answer the question by saying thread handling is one of the biggest bugaboos in operating systems. And it's not going away because you've got all these cores and you, if you, you know, do what I actually did, which is go to NVIDIA uh, or to, or you work in the GPU space, you look in the GPUs and you go, oh my God, it's full of cores, right? It's just, <laughs> it's more cores here than I've ever seen. And so, so that you have to kind of start organizing them as groups and, you know, have warps and, but there's, there is like a huge multi-threading problem in the GPU space, a growing multi-threading problem in the CPU space because we're still growing laterally now, right? Moore's law is, is over, by the way. I think we hit the ceiling uh, this year or we will next year. And then that's basically just keep going parallel uh, or keep distributing the computation. Oh, shove it into a DPU or shove it into a GPU, shove it into another CPU running another host with uh, Rocky or you know something for really high-speed transport. And you distributed shared memory, and right when you get into HPC, all that stuff is just the bread and butter, and and it's all clusters of machines. So, should FreeBSD uh, adopt Grand Central Dispatch? I would say at this point, the low-level C APIs for it are nice, but I wouldn't use them directly. I would I would wrap something else around GCD. I, I mean, I'd still support the C APIs because they're, they're convenient, they're easy to use, right? And you can sprinkle them through your code and make it multi-threaded without ever having to think about threading at all, right? There's no explicit threads in Grass that you dispatch. You don't think about threads, you think about queues. So we ported, I mean, Robert Watson did a GCD port to, to BSD, uh, I think I paid him to do that. Uh, when I was at Apple, uh, I wanted another port uh, of GCD as a reference, um, but, but that or some higher level semantic, if you look at how Swift uses GCD, for example, it's it's really it's really implicit, right? If you look at Go and the Go routines and stuff, right? There are higher level models and metaphors to consume now. And then you can use something like GCD under the covers. I'm just cognizant that, you know, it's like 15 years after GCD was invented or whatever it was, right? But, you know, things have gotten more and more and more abstract since then. But, uh, but fundamentally, you need a solution. Absolutely. Okay. Um, so I have, I would have what I think I can, if I remember it correctly, I can ask you about. I remember reading a little bit about a story, uh, or maybe something posted on Usenet that at some point you had used wall to send a message and it went oh, come on. than you. <laughs> Fine. Let, 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 me, let, let, let me move past that finally. Uh, yeah, yeah, no. it, it, it's on my Wikipedia page. Uh, you can read the gory details there. I don't know who put that story there, by the way, but it is true. Uh, I did our wall the internet. I, I, <laughs> what, what, I think, what, what I think was actually more, more, more funny than our wall the internet, well, it wasn't funny at the time, it was a mistake. So again, look, look it up on Wikipedia, it's all documented there. But um, is the fact that I think two years 
there was a fictitious Olympics called the the Usenet Spam Olympics. Uh, it was written by some 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 wit on Usenet, and and he he nominated me, uh, or he, he gave me a prize in the Spam Olympics as the first spammer. Because I had put this this text on on you know tens of thousands of screens uh, all over the world, um, and you know obviously I wasn't selling uh, hair extensions or anything. I was just saying hi. <laughs> so it, if it was spam, it wasn't very commercially successful spam. But but I, I was I was greatly amused by that. It's like yeah okay, it's it's a fair cop. I guess I am the first spammer. The first person to annoy people internet wide, but not the last. So, barely related, you may find it interesting. You've had several bug reports recently um, from Robert Morris um, finding <laughs> like all sorts of exploits and things um, in FreeBSD, like like really interesting bugs. But yeah, yeah, when, when going back to early his, days, when he did his original. Uh, uh, original worm uh i remember we called him rtfm for robert t morris because <laughs> he caused a lot of trouble a lot of systems got shut down yeah and i, I think it used a finger d hole as like one of its primary propagation mechanisms so there, there were i mean speaking of our wall there were a lot of services running at the internet back then that had no access controls and that was essentially what I found was that you know our walling a little message to the to the broadcast group would end up running through every single entry in any uh, at host text because remember the internet and that they had every host in your tech host text file um, and and just to say hey hi here's a message for you and if you're running X it'll go into the frame buffer and just just write all over your screen which is what I did to the inspector general of the Arbanet, Dennis Perry. So um, yeah, yeah, I got a lot of attention for that. So another question, uh, well, I have a couple of different questions here. Um, so somebody asked, uh, do you have any thoughts about the kind of generic, let's see, if, I'll read the question, you can ask, see how you want to answer it. The mm -hmm. generic sound kind of driver from, that went from Linux into FreeBSD, um, this person says in October of 93, it is still in the tree as PCM. Although my memory is that Cameron Grant like pretty much rewrote PCM. Yeah. So that's quite the Linux driver anymore. No, no, no. So I mean, I'm going to correct that. Um, well, so there were, there were two audio drivers. So remember, remember dev speaker, which was a PCM driver for the speaker in your PC, um, which by the way, only goes on and only goes off. <laughs> oh, you but, missed you missed a bite shed from hell about how we didn't have the frequency right, or like we've had this long standing bug, and that's why the, the, the key beep was, was annoying. And so we could still leave it on if we fixed it to actually do the frequency. Yeah, this is like in the last <laughs> awesome. year. Oh, that sounds like the best bike shed ever. Yeah, so so that speaker was really the first audio driver in KVC. And I, and I bring it up for two reasons. One, to give credit where credit is due, because Dev Speaker did work and you could actually PCM uh, tones to it. You could play music through it, you know, PCM music. Uh, it sounded horrible, but, but you could do it. And second reason is Dev Speaker, the source code for it, if you find it, is some of the most brilliant code I have ever read. I'm just gonna say it right here in the public. Dev Speaker's implementation blew my mind. Whoever whoever wrote that, I don't remember the, uh, their name, uh, was an unsung genius. Cameron Grant is another unsung genius who wrote who wrote the the real audio code and uh, support for the Sound Blaster and all the early uh, you know uh, audio cards. And what a lot of people don't remember or know about Cameron is that he was completely paralyzed. He had the same uh, uh, neurogenerative disease that Stephen Hawk Hawking had. So I went to visit him in the UK and uh, my wife and I uh, went to meet him and his caregiver 
And he was very happy to see us. He was in some really obscure part of the UK. I remember we had to take like two buses and a train and right. It was, you know, a, a, a lot of work to get out into these, you know, this highly suburban environment he was in. But I remember meeting him and just thinking he was one of the finest, most amazing humans I had ever met because he had typed out well, one, he was just a really nice guy. He was just really, really fun to talk to. And, and, and you know, his personality came through online. But he typed that entire driver using a straw in his mouth, typing on the keyboard with his, with his mouth. So when I saw that, I was just like, okay. <laughs> you know, I can't, I can't even imagine how you did that. So yeah, Cameron, one of FreeBSD's early heroes. Another uh, sadly passed away eventually from his illness, but uh, but he wrote some great code and under the most challenging circumstances possible. So I would say the audio code has, <laughs> has a wonderful li lineage uh, of you know brilliance and perseverance in FreeBSD, but it doesn't come from Linux. Okay, um, I will not repost people giving things to your things you already answered your people found the link to your spam award i think uh, Wait, what? Over IRC. oh yeah 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 no, it's yeah the exact message you know this, this is a test of area coverage or something uh reaching everybody berkeley i really <laughs> turned out it went wider than that Somebody had a question back to ftp.cdrom.com asking what ftp daemon was used that can handle that load Oh, wow, that's a great question. We started originally with it with the stock TPD, but I think David Green back on it. Um, somebody did. So I remember, you know, the one that so the FTPD that set the records was not stock FTPD. Um, but now, now you've left me really wondering because it's, it's sort of one of those implementation details. I just remember like, oh, yeah, we're going to have to do this, we're going to have to do this. And, but weren't 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 socket uh, or accept filters? Not done? accept filters, but sin file. I think was David yes. did sin file for his FTBT, and that was a big part of getting to the the performance he got. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Um, so so that was you know, that is a great example of you know, uh, uh, form uh, following function. Right. It was. It was, it was but okay, what do we need to do to make FreeBSD be the very best uh, FTP server in the world? And yeah, that's right, SIN file. Boy, I, that's a blast from the past. I thought about that for a long time. Um, I think KQs might have also been used at some point to get to, to be able to, to do the multiple dispatching because uh, our FTP was very good at, at running multiple requests. But you had to throttle, right? Because at some point you overwhelmed the SCSI bus, and now you're just you're you know you're contending with yourself. So a lot of that that stuff was tuned by hand based on feedback and, and telemetry and you know, statistics coming from the server. So yeah, in fact, I think uh, David Greenman subsequently uh, turned all of that FTP expertise into Download.com. Uh, David was was behind that, so. He he did he he got the message that the internet was a big deal, uh, and <laughs> took took his experience and created that uh, that service. Okay, let's see. Um, I have an older question from a while ago, which was when you were talking about Alpha. Did you have a like a general impression of the Alpha architecture compared to other architectures you had worked with? Um. Well, you know, I mentioned earlier that I was a big fan of the National Semiconductor Architecture just because it was so VAX-like. Um, of course, that that architecture failed. Right? There's too many bugs in the CPU, essentially. Um, the Alpha, oh, I tried hard to like it. I really did. Uh, I mean, it 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 definitely was a was a CPU that could do some serious flexing for its time, right? And again, it was the first sixty four bit, you know, sort of even remotely commodity priced CPU. So I think it deserves you know a lot of kudos for being first. Um, and it was certainly nowhere near as bad as you know some of the 
the, the hacks that the x86 was doing as it was evolving and growing and you know trying to you know, continue to get performance out of what was some 8086 on increasing amounts of steroids so if you're comparing it i would say the alpha was pretty clean uh but but it wasn't as clean as some of the other cpu architectures i, I like the 88k for example and that was that was a decent architecture uh, so i'm kind of an architecture snob Any other questions? I've asked on IRC, we're also at an hour. I don't know how much, that, I think that's about how much of your time I asked for too. So I don't want to take up too much time. Yeah, I mean, I can I can go the full remaining three minutes, uh, but yes, I do need to, uh, oh, here's a question. Did I make sure to back up my FreeBSD releases to the internet archival for long-term archival? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I, I didn't do anything explicitly. I, you know, we just released the bits. Uh, no, I don't think anybody at the time was really thinking of posterity. You know, I mean, I'd have kept my old 67 Mustang fastback if I knew that you know, a car might be worth restoring someday. But at the time, it was like, ah, this thing doesn't run very well. So, so no, I, I haven't done it, but I'm sure someone has. Um, it looks like uh, it looks like Des has a comment, uh, a question about ARM. Um, I like the ARM architecture. Um, yeah, I mean, we had a little trouble buying it, but other than that, uh, I think it's it's a it's a solid architecture. And and uh, I mean, I have a lot of experience with it since Apple uh, obviously invested in it, in it so highly. Um, in fact, interestingly enough, I. I had an Acorn A5 machine when I lived in Ireland, which was also based on, on you know, the Archimedes ARM processor, which was the early, you know, early days ARM. So I've actually been a fan of the of the processor architecture for a while. Um, it's going to be interesting to see you know how it how it goes in, in the server market. Um, so obviously, I think that I think it's time for that. You know that to be tried again. We've had some folks who, who tried to make uh, ARM server plays before um, with, you know, less and more success. But I think I think uh, time is ripe to, to, to push that. Again. So, and obviously, you know, NVIDIA is, is a big part of that. So, so yeah, I like ARM. I like ARM and I think, I think it's going to be, I think it's, I think it's a huge success, obviously. Right. I mean, it's, you know, it's everywhere. In fact, I'm going to I'm going to take that opportunity to, to give a mini rant, which is I would love FreeBSD, love 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 FreeBSD to run on every single Raspberry Pi part as one of the default images, because the thing that people really uh, kind of miss uh, when they think about ARM is it's not just all up here or all on your you know your fancy phone or your iPad or whatever, which is really pretty you know serious heavy duty ARM CPU parts. Uh, and obviously, you know, video's grace is going to be, you know, even, even more impressive, but down at the low end too, is where you get parts uh, until the chip shortage kind of screwed up the pricing for a while, uh, where you can get, get a whole PC for under 50 bucks. And, you know, it's one of my personal passions to see computing spread, uh, in underdeveloped nations, right? And I was like, I basically would love anybody to be able to have a workable, Unix system for fifty dollars or less, right? and then including the price of the SD card, and you know, go scrounge a keyboard and a mouse from from you know from the recycling uh, place somewhere, and then an old screen that you know nobody else wants anymore, and boom, you know, for not so much money, you've got a full desktop. So I've got a ton of Raspberry Pis on my desk. You can't see my IoT desk from here. My little whole desk full of IoT devices, including all the stuff that NVIDIA makes, right? And um, and it's it's awesome stuff because it's just increasing power so much with every generation. The Raspberry Pi 4 is is a great little machine. It's it's great. I mean, you know, I use a full-blown Mac workstation, so I'm not going to use it as my personal workstation, but I run all my, my 3D printers off of uh, Raspberry Pis. I have the front end pretty much every automation task I have at my house. So I want to run FreeBSD on those things. 
and I want to be able to get the OS image straight from the Rasp, you know, Raspberry Pi website. So I put that challenge out to the FreeBSD community. If you want to run on something that every single person on the planet can afford, that would be great. What's FreeBSD missing on the Raspberry Pi? A full desktop with with you know Minecraft and a few cool you know and Python ID and everything. Look at Raspbian. The Raspberry Pi OS for Linux is awesome. It's truly awesome because it's it's a batteries included everything you need to be instantly productive environment. It's got all the GPIO libraries installed, the I2C and Spy. Everything is set up to just be an out of box experience that you just go boom. And so that's that's the that's the key part, right? It's just aggregating all the stuff together and having a nice little desktop distribution for the Pi. And it, and it has to be a desktop distribution because that's where people are going to start, right? Then you you can have a lightweight version if you know, and a headless and a lot of well, I want to run a lot of my, my own pies, but that's the truth, right? First, you have to hit the goal of you know the full batteries included version, and then be able to to customize it and subtract stuff out. In my personal opinion. So one more question from IRC. Um, mm -hmm. So I know. I guess you worked in genomics for a while, or gen I'll, I'll probably butcher that. Did you have the opportunity to uh, use FreeBSD in any way in that space? I guess someone's no. asking, is there a chance FreeBSD is running in a se sequencer somewhere? Nope, all Linux. And the reason being that, you know, when you go to uh, their site or any of the big SOM vendors, you know, system on module, which you're going to put into a portable, you know, or agnostics device, it, all the drivers, all the all the boot code, you know, all the device support is Linux, Linux, Linux. And that's that's not really even so much the, the fault of the FreeBSD community. It's the vendors, right? Calling, calling, you know, these uh, various companies in Israel who produce SOMAs, for example, and say, hey, can you support FreeBSD? Click, right? Is is kind of a you know difficult a chicken and egg scenario, right? I mean, they would totally answer your phone call if you represented somebody with you know some number of zeros on the check. Uh, then that's a different conversation. But um, you know, getting FreeBSD into the into the embedded world uh, requires a lot of low level, you know, stuff. And and ironically, one of FreeBSD's early contributors is is a uh, uh, Jakob Klama, and his his company in Warsaw does a ton of that kind of stuff. But it's it's mostly Linux because that's what their their customers are asking for. But you know, he's got the know how to do it. <laughs> Somebody, somebody wanted uh, you know to 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 put it on something. So so yeah, for my for my biomedical stuff, uh, I just lived in, in Linux all the time. In fact, Jakob uh, worked for me for a while and did a custom Linux distro that was perfectly tailored to the psalms that we were shooting. You know, nothing more, nothing less than what you need. And uh, so, if FreeBSD can figure out how to crack that and create those customized, you know, tailor made uh, distributions. Um, that'd be that'd be cool. That would also, you know, take care of the Raspberry Pis and the, the other competitors who I think are going to increasingly try and challenge Raspberry for for you know that sort of twenty dollar computer space. Um, and again, don't diss the twenty dollar computer. I mean, you look at the like the Pi Zero Two and some of the later generations; they're they're capable too. They have they have a full on you know. Uh, decent memory footprint they got wi-fi they got bluetooth they got all the radios you need uh to just just be an internet appliance i ran i run home assistant and a bunch of things on, on raspberry Pis, and they're, they're just great so yeah i would love to have had freebsd on the sum is the answer to that question it just was too hard okay um well, I guess I have one more question that I have, and then I can let you go if you, especially if we're, we're already a few minutes past, so I don't know what your yeah. schedule is like. Let, um, let me look real quick. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, actually, I don't have a hard stop, shockingly, you know, so okay. I can go a bit over. Okay, well, the, one more question that somebody asked. He's actually one of your coworkers because he also works at NVIDIA in a different part. Mm -hmm. um, he asked about, are, do you have any thoughts about network performance on multiprocessor systems, in particular, um, more recent synchronization methods like uh, AppBuck and FreeBSD or SMR, which are similar to Linux's read, copy, update. So kind of safe memory rec reclamation schemes. Yeah, I mean, 
Well, boy, that's a complicated topic. <laughs> I don't know if we have enough time for that, but but you know the the RCU implementation is is a great example uh, of something that yes, it's and it's a linchpin of of a lot of uh, different subsystems, and you know you can get you know with, uh, a IRCU, I think it's called, uh, to do a lot of this in user land, uh, but. But I think the, the more fundamental question, particularly since um, Mellanox, I think, still supports FreeBSD as a as a you know a good citizen and and has a lot of uh, driver support, is how are clusters of FreeBSD machines going to talk to each other at high speed, right? And you know, low latency, high throughput, talking you know 400 gigabit per second interfaces, and you're talking multiple 400 gigabit per second interfaces. So that's the kind of that's the world in which I live every day uh, because I work for Nvidia. Uh, so you have to do computational offload <laughs> at those sorts of aggregate data rates, right? If you're if you're dealing with you know terabits per second in the aggregate, are you going to do if you're going to have your CPU do all the crypto? Uh, you know, compression, decompression, because you want to get more than terabits per second, or you know whatever whatever line rate types of computation you want to do that's a very fertile area for os research and and that is absolutely where where things are heading right it's no longer about your machine it's about a cluster of machines um and yes certainly cloud will continue to have its role and you'll have stuff that's you know far enough away that you're not going to think be thinking about things like rocky or you know, InfiniBand or 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 NVLink or any of the really high speed uh, uh, transport uh, methods, but even talking into the cloud can 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 uh, involve some pretty high data rates depending on you know the speed of your transit, and then within the cloud that you may build or rent or lease or whatever, you're going to have again as you're building these large uh, you know partition global address space applications whatever, particularly for AI right. You're going to have some 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 serious data on your hands, so I'm not sure what the exact question was, but I'm going to read that as: Is it important for FreeBSD to be cognizant of high speed networking? The answer is yes, absolutely, because that's the bottleneck, right? Where there's multiple bottlenecks, but if you're going to put more compute power into a node, how do you get data to it quickly enough that? The watts that it's burning are, are being constructively burned, right? That you're, you're just crunching through as much data as you can, particularly when you're doing training. Uh, and the answer is, mm, that's a hard problem. You have to optimize a lot of different uh, pieces of the problem to get the CPUs and GPUs fed at the appropriate data rates because you're dealing with enormous, enormous training data sets now. Just getting the data into the, the code that's training. And of course, you get that because oh, half a billion parameter model. Can I put that on the same mm, Maybe, <laughs> right? I'm gonna start and run out of headroom though. I'd rather put it on four machines and, and chuck it up. So the parallelism between the nodes and and how they're talking to each other. So RDMA, right? Basically, that's you know that's the kernel challenge. How do I do RDMA to storage? How do I do RDMA to other nodes? Uh, RDMA you know, from the network controller to bring stuff in and out of the network fabric. If you're not doing RDMA, you're doing it wrong. Kind of, you know, I'm being dramatic to make a point, but it's, you know, seriously, I mean, at those data rates, you have no other choice. Well, I keep saying one more question, but this time I mean it, because it okay. there's a fun question in the chat here on Zoom from Deb at the foundation. She's asking, how many pets do you have? Yeah, I, I did a call. At some point, there was like a cat counter on your webpage when I first met you, like in, back in '99 or 2000 or so. Yeah, that went out of date really quickly. Uh, so, so yes, I am now. I'm currently down to ten cats and five dogs. Uh, and not that I'm saying down to. Uh, my wife was a volunteer at a pet shelter for a while, uh, and that uh, that meant that we got all the broken ones. Um, but they're all awesome. You know, I've got a one-eyed cat just running around right now. Uh, as you saw her briefly in the in the Zoom. Um, and uh, so, yeah, uh, ten cats, five dogs, and I think twenty-four koi, and that's currently it. 
we're actually on the downward slope right now. We're, we're trying not to try not to get any just focus on quality of life and the number that we have. Okay. We've had, we've had easily twice as many different times. But but you know, when you ask the next question, well, how do you handle that? Well, we have a cattery, it's all been built out to to house the cats and they're all indoor only and they don't go outside and get eaten by wildlife. We live in the mountains, so we have a lot of land around us. The dogs can run around, not annoy anybody. So you gotta have the you know, I wouldn't do this in an apartment for sure. Well, thank you very much for spending time with us today and talking about all sorts of things um, and some pleasure. early history stuff. So we really appreciate it. Yeah, it's been my pleasure. Thanks for having me on. Okay, thanks, George. Thanks later, folks. Cheers. Okay. Bye. And for folks um, coming to the summit, thank you for coming to our first day. Uh, we will start again tomorrow at about the same time. I mean. Tomorrow, depending on your time zone, I know some of you folks are already in tomorrow in your time zone. Um, but uh, several hours from now, we'll start up again for day two, uh, Friday, and we'll see you then. Thank you for coming to our day, and we'll see you tomorrow. Bye, all.